we've got uh, four we've got four um four projects and i thought we'd spend something like a half an hour a piece but we'll see what it goes and um but i think you're gonna find them kind of very intriguing it's ended up being just an extremely kind of interesting um, site condition but uh again uh brian you, do you want to start off then brian We'll Did you, you want to start, start off? Listen. And then Eric will join us when he joins us. Wilson? Wilson? Wilson or I can start, Tom. Um, it doesn't matter who. Hi. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can Wilson start. I wants I was, to start? Yeah, I thought I was starting. Um, okay, but, Wilson, go for it. Sure. Sorry, my mute was on. I thought it was uh, Oh. Oh. Uh, You guys are seeing what I'm seeing, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, nice. that's cool. Um, so yeah, we took the photos of the, um, so our site is in um, Irwindale, um, basically a industrial mining town, um, slightly um, outside of um, uh, LA, LA city. And I mean, this picture says it all, a giant hole within the, within the city fabric. Um, these are giant um, and they started digging um, from the 20s and then they got really heated up during the 50s um, where they dug up all the minerals to build um, literally all the highways in Southern California. And um, these pits are getting really deep about um, 200 feet. And that's like the limit that they can go. So, they're, so the city is trying to rethink about what they can use these land for after um, the industrial life is done. Um, so geographically, um, Irwindale is this funny looking shape um, located uh, right at the edge of the city between, between the metropolitan area and north um, where, where the St. Gabriel Mountains are. Um, and the, the development of the city itself towards um, the location of the site is really interesting as well. Um, so if we can look through the timeline of um, the urban growth in LA, uh, Irwindale was always the kind of off to the side edge condition um, industrial city that's not always um, kind of be a part of the city. And even now, if we take a look at um, the density um, of all the cities within LA, it's right next to all the cities um, like uh, Baldwin Park, Arcadia, that's really dense and populated, but this is like this remnants of, of, the, of, of the city that's not being used and it's got um, one of the worst population density within the entire LA metropolitan area. You can see this on the top, this little sliver. Um, but if we want to rethink about the position of the city, because it's so interesting right now, um, if we start to hypothesize what if Irwindale is, is now thought about as the center of LA? Because it's within proximity to many of the other um, kind of um, relevant cities like downtown Long Beach, Anaheim, even Riverside in um, Ontario. And I mean, this is also backed up by a lot of different evidence by um, uh, freeway connections. It's always at the it's it's at the cross of the ten the two two. 210 and also the 605, which is uh, very much connected to many parts of the, of the metropolitan area. Also um, by means of um, uh, Metro Transit as well, it's, it's also at, at the crossroad, which is very much connected to everywhere, everywhere else in the, in, the, in the metropolitan area. It's got some, um, the, the site's got some really interesting ecological connections as well. And we can start to see this, um, green belt that is being built um, directly from, from the top where, where reservoirs are and, and kind of connected with the San Gabriel River and ends up at Seal Beach into the Pacific Ocean. Um, we can see this in the area photo as well, um, where the re reservoirs are. Um, they're experiencing some kind of drought as well, mm -hmm. but um, where, where our site is and how it's like 
di directly connecting to, to Steel Beach and Long Beach in that direction. Um, so we looked deeper into um, the San Gabriel River. What we found out it's, it's one of the three river and one of the three watersheds within um, LA metropolitan area. So the first one is uh, the LA River, as we all know. Um, the second one is the San Gabriel River and the third one is um, the Santa Ana River. And what's interesting about this is that um, there's an ongoing project by Frank Gary, um, Gary Partners, on, on the kind of renovation and development of the first um, watershed, which is the LA River watershed. And we wanna kind of project that forward and think about um, what can we do about that with the second watershed, which is the San Gabriel River watershed and where Irwindale is located and maybe even further in, what, what, what can we think about the third one, the, the Santa Ana River bed, uh, watershed as well. So zooming deeper um, into the location of our site, um, it's surrounded by kind of residential cities. And um, so kind of this is more relating to my own project now where um, I have this idea of connecting um, this entire green belt from the mountain towards the ocean and um, kind of having this kind of ecological connection that, that, that punctures through the entire metropolitan area. And I just also wanna put on another proposition of um, increasing density towards, towards this, um, this kind of dying um, industrial town and, and how we can start to move the, 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 um, the density of, of Irwindale towards the new Irwindale, which, which uh, will shoot its rank of, of the density within the LA County from 249 towards um, 30, which is about the same um, density as you get in some of the beach cities, um, such as Manhattan Beach or Hermosa Beach, a little slightly denser than, than those cities. Hmm. Um, so I'm looking into um, the, my project as kind of three different parts. The first part is um, these buildings that surround the pit um, and I'm calling them kind of uh, lakeshore, neighbor, lakeshore neighborhoods and they, they kind of want to reactivate the, the sides of the pit and that's where I found um, this project or the site really interesting is how you can kind of start to um, use them in some kind of interesting way. Um, and then the second part of, of, the, of the project is um, kind of this continuous fabric that connects uh, existing uh, houses that, that belongs to the city and kind of uh, drives it through the entire, an, an entire new city of uh, New Irwindale, as I call it. And the third one is how um, everything is kind of glued and tied together with this, with this uh, institutional landscape. Um, that is made out of many different parts. Um, so let's start with the landscape. Um, it, it's it's kind of, it's most of the project is landscaping um, and the, the ratio to the building itself is uh, one to 19 and the entire area that we're pr producing with, with this greenery is about, um, or slightly smaller than Griffith Park itself. Um, hmm. So first we, we, we find on the site is a already existing super big, um, not national level, county level recreational park. It's the Santa Fe Dam Recreational Park. And it's about the size of an Elysian Park already. Um, secondly, creating a um, elevator park that spans over the entire project connecting north to south and also east to west with these um, kind of strategic um, uh, grids that uh, interconnects with each other with these um, kind of um, landscaping bridges. Um, and then we, we find these um, on the ground level, these street parks that's open to the public. And some are also um, kind of shared private parks, which connects to the housing. And then also kind of more exclusive um, rooftop private gardens. Um, that's, that's like lesser part of the project. Um, as, as we were talking about the strategic um, implication of the positioning of the site or the geographical positioning of the site, it's right at the intersection 
um, between two freeways. And also the freeway by, bypasses the entire length of the project, which is um, also bridged by the elevated park. And we're covering the, the kind of moving traffic of the freeway by walking across it on top of it. Um, so with the freeway, we're, we expect to look at um, how um, cars are connected towards this um, newer grid that we're creating. And this grid uh, kind of uh, subdivides the city into, into these smaller, um, you can call it uh, single family housing units or different affordable kind of housing unit um, scales. And this grid comes directly also from the existing city grid and it kind of becomes a hybrid because it's not, it's not a kind of mono grid that the city has. It's got like two, two very distinctive grids um, clashing together, let's say. And it, it, it creates this very interesting place um, where, where our project is, where, where the two grids come together um, to create this new kind of um, like a monster of the different grids. Um, but looking forward from just vehicular transportation, I was also thinking how um, LA could be connected in the future as well. It's probably through more of an automated um, transportation surface or uh, APM, automated people mover. Um, and it's also very close proximity to already existing railways. And um, so strategically thinking how we can start to implement another um, transportation system within this new city and putting a line um, through the entire city with, with different stops. These circles are like five minutes walking circles. And it gives us um, a new kind of notion of where density and where new buildings will be um, in, in the future as well and how have to organize the city. So looking um, closer at the numbers of the city, we're kind of creating a city with um, different densities because um, it's, it's more or less trying to echo the diversity or the unique characteristic that each city has within LA. And each city has a very different kind of living and different kind of um, communication or, or as we call it neighborhood. Um, and I wanna uh, recreate that kind of feeling within, within this new city of um, Irwindale. So um, city density could range from very little like a, like a beach town or up to somewhere like New York City or Shenzhen with a more populous center in the middle. And then um, kind of breaking down uh, of what these buildings mean and, and how, what the mass of these are and actually kind of figuring out um, how many inhabitants these are taking. And we're, we're mostly focusing on, um, on, on densifying this middle line, uh, which is where the, uh, what I'm thinking the, the, the newer transportation system will be and where most people will be arriving in the city. Um, and this is where the denser crowd would be. But at the same time, um, there, there will still be kind of different um, housing that would use um, vehicular transportation as well, which is um, kind of affordable housing units around the perimeter um, of the project and also um, by where the, where the grid and the freeways are. And also um, just smaller um, single family housing units, which is kind of a um, extension of the existing um, city fabric and also um, kind of helps to increase the, the, the area and the density and the population of the surrounding city. Um, so, and if we kind of look through um, how the buildings are, how the buildings are situated within these ponds, um, these point gets down to like 200 feet, uh, 200 feet deep. So sometimes um, we can see buildings that slightly pokes out, but they're actually 20 floors under the ground and we can still have sufficient light, air, um, and uh, a very beautiful um, kind of lakeshore view to, to, to occupiers. Um, and also focusing on this red line is where all the kind of denser um, uh, population or the, or the city would, would, would live on because they have the closest 
closest um, kind of reach towards the transportation system. Um, some images of the, of the project of the city. Um, so, and again, um, we can see this clear, uh, I'm just trying to call it a spine um, that, that links up where the, where the densities are uh, while, while these, uh, this greenscape kind of um, connects, connects the fabric, moves it together, as well as um, uh, uh, crosses, um, crosses kind of these crucial infrastructure like the freeway um, and, the, and the river and creates a connection um, for the existing um, population uh, between east and, uh, east and west as well as um, creating this kind of new pathway, as we can see out uh, from, the, from the northeast towards the southwest, um, which connects directly towards Seal Beach. Thank you. You want to put a group of all the images in so we could talk about where we want to go, Wilson? Yeah, yeah, of course. Good. Uh, I have to reshare this. So. You know, uh, I think Eric's I'm, I'm talking, gonna... but he's muted right now. No, I, Eric. How about I, that? I have to leave in a minute. I just like to throw in a word or two. Um, I, first of all, I like the way you, uh, you set up your analysis and you've developed these three basic um, uh, elements, the open space, the density, and what was the last one? Maybe it's transit. Um, <laughs> landscape, uh, neighborhood, and water, yeah. Uh, it seems to me that, that um, first of all, I think it's really an imaginative idea, and I like the idea of, of, of trying to create a center for Irwindale, and I, I guess... I, my question is, is it, does Irwindale really have a center now or is it, is it just, this is geographically the center, I guess, right? So it could be become the new, the new, new Irwindale, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so I think that that idea is a pretty significant one. I think the issue of water is really important because the rivers, <coughs> the rivers tend to flood and uh, you've talked about the the three uh, watersheds, which are really important, and the San Gabriel is is um, uh, it floods just like the LA River does. So the, the issue of water management becomes important. So the question would be, how do you manage uh, the water to maintain certain levels? And you know, and I think that's that's a really uh, sort of fundamental. Um, the collision of the grids is really interesting. And I think the idea of using open space as a potential for resolving the conflict is, is an interesting thing. And I, I, a little hard to understand how it was done, but it certainly, uh, it, it, it represents the potential of being able to resolve the, the collision of the two grids. And uh, uh, it's just that you don't want it to be too suburban. You want it to be urban and, uh, um, I guess my last comment is, has to do with identity. If it, if it is the, the new center for Irwindale, um, is there a skyline or is there, because it, when you look at it in the satellite, it really is, it's, it's incredibly interesting. And in elevation, it becomes kind of a really important uh, expression. And, you know, the 200 foot drop sort of works against you <laughs> in some ways. So uh, it's a little hard to see it uh, from a distance, but uh, but I I think you know I, I'm 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 very excited about the scheme. I, I just uh, there's just so many more questions though, and uh, so I'm just opening it up and and unfortunately I have to leave for half an hour, but I'll be back. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask a small favor if you don't mind. I somehow got the wrong link here. So I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. And I <laughs> came in, I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> can you give me a, like a two, uh, a 20 second synopsis, just very brief. And I, uh, sorry to ask you to redo, 
just a little bit where it is, what it is, why it is something real quick. Do you mind doing that? Sure. Uh, well, it's, it's Irwindale, um, which are these um, kind of mining pits that, that is uh, right outside of LA. And we're trying to rethink if this is a very industrial town. And I'm trying to think what if this town becomes the new center for the, for the, for the city, uh, for the entire metropolitan area of LA. Uh, which is like directly connected with all the freeways, all the metro system. Um, and then kind of looking closer at the site, I was trying to um, think about a way of using three methods to, to, to deal with um, constructing the city. One is kind of identifying all the lakeshore buildings, how to reactivate these uh, dug in pits, which are 200 feet deep. Um, and then how to extend or, or, um, it's not upgrade, but it's uh, kind of extent, extension of the existing urban fabric that kind of goes through the new city. Um, and then how the landscaping could also work with this in, in various types, some are on the ground, some are uh, covering over um, the entire city that, that, that kind of uh, bridges between, between kind of freeways and also, um, uh, also between the river. So it, it creates this this glue that, that ties um, different sides of the city together while creating this new connection, um, which is a very important one, uh, ecological con oh, sorry. Uh, ecological connection that we uh, found that is um, from the north um, where, where, where mountains are and the reservoir to, to the south directly connecting it to, to the ocean, to the Pacific Ocean, which is, um, we, can, we can see in this, in this image. So where the reservoir is and connection towards Irwindale site and then this greenery along St. Gabriel River towards the Pacific Ocean. And basically this, this new city for, um, we, we, we said it was for um, 100,000 people, but now um, I've slightly increased it into 130,000 and it's got different densities within the neighborhood. So some are uh, as dense as um, Hermosa Beach, some are Denser like Shenzhen or New York City, because um, some some are more commercially based and some are more residential based. Did I did I understand you to say that this was the new center for LA? You don't mean that the center of LA is shifting to Irwindale. You mean Irwindale is another option? LA yes, is yes, not moving. Yes. LA is not moving to Irwin, Irwindale. Or are you saying that? You're not saying that. No, uh, what I was thinking something among like the lines of uh, a century city, uh, as we discussed it from before, um, how it creates another kind of cluster of, of they're not they're not skyscrapers, but they're a cluster of offices and 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 they're like a, another downtown away from a downtown. So how how can we Listen, put up the one where you that? showed the, the main centers of the metropolis? Oh, yes. You had an image that showed it very clearly. And they were abstract, they were scaled, right? Yeah, yeah, according to density. Right here, the, the, pull that one up. Because you have to correct, Bill, you're not rebuilding Irwindale, you're building a new center, like you just said. Exactly. It's another century, it's a lot of fonts. It's a century city. I have a couple observations, if I may, Tom and Eric. I didn't, are you done, Eric? Were you going to ask some questions? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll come, okay. I'll come back. I, I, I appreciate the uh, interlude. Thank you. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, I'll come okay. back. Um, can you go back to your site plan, Wilson, that shows the water bodies? Sure. I mean, I, I think this is very exciting. You know, it touches upon the, the you know, our recent excavatory past um, touches upon principles of resource harvesting, um, specifically water harvesting. Um, and I wonder if you could understand this, Wilson, really is not so much bringing Irwindale to the ocean, but bringing the ocean into Irwindale um, and not so much skylines and the profile lines of towers that develop the financial resource for the city, but that craters and pits of water, that subtractions actually develop the resource for the entire basin. 
Um, I mean, I think if you if you pitch this as I'm going to call it a cenota urbanism. Do you know what a cenota is in Mexico? It's like when no. an asteroid hits, meteor no, hits the planet, it, lots of parts go everywhere, and it makes these subterranean. That's water where they. Bases. That's where they throw people after they die. In the, <laughs> also, in the cenote. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but what's interesting about these is they're they're covered water bodies. They're an incredibly majestic space and they're they're kind of preternatural they're slightly alien and pretty fantastic um if you've seen footage of them and i think the if i understand it right you have a really big roof on this you're suggesting like hundreds of acres of of raised um acreage here right a kind of elevated park you called it um, and I'm just wondering if that if you had more craters of water at more scales, could they replace swimming pools, recreational water bodies, water harvesting? And could you slide that covered parkway on top of them? Right now, they all appear to be open to the air. But if you start to think of them more as cauldrons or tanks or reservoirs, but they're beautiful like a cenota. So that's not, you're not capping it, just to be clear. There's an oculus, it's porous. That would, you know, that could help build moisture and essentially produce its own microclimate. I mean, you have the, you know, you have the San Gabriels right there. You have an amazing freshwater runoff supply, but you could essentially say that this is, you know, this is a new kind of a dam that we live in. We don't just, you know, it's not just emergency water and the covering of it is part of the way we interact with it and sell that as a kind of fan fantastic system of caverns. That's a kind of archipelago of water bodies. That's the antidote to the coastal ocean, you know, 20th century icon of the beach of LA. Like this becomes a whole new kind of urbanism out here. I mean, to me, that kind of a pitch Make, makes it believable, Tom, that this could be a new kind of center. Whether we call that a resource center, whether we monetize the water to become the new financial tower, if you will, you know, I could imagine deep wells being the equivalent of a tower here, where I have a water bank that's a kind of artificial aquifer that's worth like, you know, a half of a billion dollars if I have a hundred square feet, but it goes you know, 200 feet deep, 300 feet deep. I could probably monetize that if I was a uh, economist that could possibly pay off more quickly than a tower or leasing and more familiar models of, of how we currently finance cities. So I think, I don't know, to me, Wilson, I just kind of wanted to get the discussion started, but the kind of pockmarked, subtractive, you know, slightly flooded archipelago with a big roof on it, I find to be a super exciting proposition, um, particularly in, in Irwindale. I think it's like, it's just geographically located in a great place to do, to begin to harness some of those things. I'll, I'll leave it to others to chat about that or other things. Wilson, uh, just, can you clarify with us uh, exactly what David was asking is, is this a green roof or is this more of a landscape? Is, is this terra firma in the, in the landscape portion? Yeah, it's, it's landscaping, but um, they, they are pretty low in most parts and they are actually only elevated when, when, when they turn into these center bridges elements that has to cross freeways and, and, and other infrastructure system like the, like the river and stuff like that for connectivity. Okay, so, um, so in terms of what in terms of what David's asking, um, or what what David's kind of imagining, it's not really a raised landscape. It, it's it's on ground, except yeah. for when it becomes a bridge. Exactly, exactly. It's not like two hundred feet uh, in the air. I think the the, the discussion is is uh, to follow up on on David's comments is to shift the the discussion from uh, talking about landscape as a recreational destination or simply one of the urban systems, which is somewhat passive 
to something that's a little bit more active uh, because we're currently right now, the, the entire discussion in the globe has to do with how urbanism <laughs> can be um, a net positive or, or, or a, a restorative strategy toward basically um, another way of engaging back back on the site. So I think what uh, what David is bringing up is a, is a much larger discussion, uh, Wilson, where any any strategy that you put on um, formally, spatially, right, is somewhat uh, seen as part of a larger hydrological and ecological management system, right, mm -hmm. of which it begins to almost be like a, a, like a lymph node, if you will, because that's what it actually looks like along the whole San Gabriel uh, watershed element. And then it becomes a typological and systemic kind of a, a, a archetype, like a prototype, if you will, right? That one can uh, one can copy, right? Because we're dealing with, um, you know, uh, as you know, you know, we're dealing with a lot of these uh, urban projects out in the Middle East, and we're dealing with these uh, dry water sheds called wadis, right? And we're doing everything that we can to kind of preciously control uh, these resources, which I think what uh, David is talking about. But how do you basically uh, monetize it into a spatial and performance um, angle? So Wilson, if you can shift that from a neutral system to an active uh, element, I think that would go a long way. Let me let me just uh, raise a couple of, of, of slightly different uh, vantage points. You said that this area had a population of about 100,000 people, or that's what you anticipated which is about the size of a town like Berkeley, uh, which, is, which is a small town, which essentially runs around a university. That's, that's its, its primary, uh, that's its primary engine of, of social and, and cultural and economic activity. And it looks to me like, um, I don't wanna categorize this, in a, in a cartoonish way that this is an ecological, a piece of ide ecological ideology and that it belongs to a whole series of conceptual preferences and assumptions about and, and postulates that anticipates where the climate of the world is going and how to respond to that in a constructive way in order to reverse that. I don't know that it has anything to do with inhabiting it either at this scale, 100,000 people, unless this belongs to an anticipation that this is a venue that won't be 100,000, that it'll be X number of million people. So trying to understand the meaning of this in a broader sense, it's an advocacy project that addresses concerns about an ecological direction. And whether, and, and the question is not so much whether the argument is appropriate, the question may be in this context, in that location, is this even a plausible discussion or is this just another kind of Athens charter? We work, we recreate, wow. we live, and we transit. In other words, what's the premise of this? What problem are we solving? I'd like Wilson, to dig into Eric's comment if we Wilson, can. Wilson, wait a Wilson, uh, let me help you answer that question. Start with the three beach towns and the social aggregate of the smaller town and the 134 different towns that make up the metropolis we call Los Angeles. Come on. It's not Berkeley. Can I ask a question? I mean, hold, hold on. But um, how many people live in Irwindale right now? A uh, couple of thousand. Very little. Very minimal. Four, 1,400 people, right? So this yeah. is a town of 1,400. I mean, I think Eric's on to something powerful that's, that's important to just discuss. Yeah, I do agree that the Cenote conversation is actually very, very interesting because those mining holes are there and there is water in them. And so there is an, I an idea to work with the existing topography. And I think that's very intelligent. The idea to green the whole territory in some effort to create a locus that is going to, I don't know, I, this isn't a new Las Vegas, but I'm not sure what this could possibly be yet. 
but you are counting on the green and, and, and the greening of a Los Angeles territory, a vast Los Angeles territory, which we know in LA is very hard to do and also ecologically maybe um, unsound, um, is what you're kind of hitting up against. To then my question, which I think is Eric's question, is what's going to bring 100,000 people or create an environment that we would want to uh, turn an industrial center, because that's what this is right now, right? This is a very clearly thought through project on the infrastructural side of LA's history to create a zone between Long Beach, uh, where warehouses take place, mining takes place. This is the industrial landscape of the city. This was a very calculated I think, uh, let me, location. Let me just interrupt. Uh, sorry for one second. I yeah, think it's all right. For what I'm saying is that you don't care to answer that question. In other words, what you're proposing doesn't respond to the issue that like, what makes people, what makes another 100,000 people go out there? That's not what this project is about. 100,000 people may go or 250,000 may go or nobody may go. And that's not really the topic of the project. Is that, is that uh, an equitable? I think I Critique. That might be that might be a viable argument you could make, right? But I do think you might want to work with the natural topography and landscape and the industrial warehouse typology a little bit more carefully in order to ensure that argument. Where you're there's basically seems, saying nothing me, has to happen there. He's basically fixing the ecology. The motivation, if if the repair of the ecology on the planet. Is not, is not for itself alone, but the repair of the ec ecology, human motivated, if that's what it is, anticipates that the people who are still around at that point will benefit from that. In other words, who are you doing this for? Mm -hmm. And how would they benefit from this? What kind of place after you've resolved a number of these questions or taken these steps, then who comes there and how do they benefit? How do they live? How do they go to concerts? How do they do business? How do they go to school? What kind of, in other words, the, 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 socio the sociology of this and the organization of the sociology and you could add culture into it. In other words, what is the meaning of a place like this? And what's, what's antithetical to that, and I don't know quite how to position this, is that one of the appeals of, of, of cities is the, the antecedents that make the cities what they are. If there's a giant hole out there for mining, the, the question is not only what you do with it, but whether it should echo as an antecedent this is where we started. I don't know, it's a seven hills of Rome or something. You know, that, that, that what is, where did this begin? What's its history? Does that matter? Or is this like a kind of Milton Keynes or Brasilia that lands in the middle of essentially nothing for tactical reasons? And what are the tactical reasons? What's the humanity of the project, not the ecology, unless you think the two words are synonyms? Oh, isn't the humanity somewhat obvious, Eric? Look, to answer your question, and Wilson, this is a very complicated project. Um, the, 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 the project very specifically addresses the next 1.5 million people that are gonna be part of the metropolitan area in, in the next 25 years and versus the ad hoc uh, distribution of that population over this total territory, like our Wilshire project, it's using this found condition to develop a new concentration of population, which utilizes uh, the site and advances the natural setting from mountain to water and, um, and uses something that's a, a, a found condition that seems to have kind of extraordinary kind of possibilities as an environment that's very particular connected to a Los Angeles climatological condition. 
that people would absolutely um it's well, that's it's, why it's I said it's towards recreation and Rory, towards a, a sound kind of ecological nature kind of condition and it seems at that level it's obvious that it, it makes sense no, and, maybe not maybe to you not to me i'm just asking for whom is it because what you're what you're delivering is a kind of ecological postulate which by its nature benefits all these other uh, piecemeal happenstance communities which aren't cognizant of this. Is so this is a proposition which is either a model for other people or other people will come to this and inhabit this because it gives them an opportunity to inhabit something which is ecological, uh, ecologically a kind of model a kind of responsible piece of planning as opposed mm -hmm. to all the other planning. So it's a prototype, it's a lesson, it's didactic. But it's also that making is. clear an argument for another, is this the sixth or seventh or eighth set or Wilson in, your, in the model, right? It's making an argument for yet another center and it happens to be positioned as you look at it in terms of the metropolis, it's, it's geographically in the center. And you can make an argument for it in terms of transportation and in terms of its location as being that seventh or eighth center as you look at the LA as a, uh, in a metropolitan condition. Well, I think, uh, you know, the, I think the whole oh. topic, um, sorry, can I just jump in briefly because Tom just mentioned this thing about the next one and a half million people that are pressing into the city until something like 2050 which is how it is anticipated. And I think this is, this is really the topic that um, we need to be thinking about here. The, the next question for this though is, why are they actually coming to LA? Because at this moment, um, that is a little bit at odds. So if we make space for people and try to be smarter with how to accommodate them and how to integrate them urbanistically as much as socially and culturally, um, then I think what David was saying earlier, David Erdman was saying earlier about the whole landscape and this landscape being really massively productive and also creating a completely different type of jobs and a, a completely other industry, if we want to still call it in, industry, because, which is that of creating the energy and the supplies and everything that we need in this city. Then I think then there is a comprehensive project. And I, knowing you, Wilson, I know that this is actually also what you've been thinking about. And I do have a little bit of a problem with this terminology of the interstitial landscape, because that makes it a bit of a formal thing. Um, and it kind of doesn't really encourage us to think of it as a much more productive and versatile and multifunctional thing. And I'm not quite sure if it's really the right term I would probably um, like to discuss this whole thing way more in the context of cohabitation, which is at this moment, this is a place that is pretty dead. I mean, I was with you at the site visit. We've seen, we've been pretty shocked, right? And um, so it is really a place that needs a lot of not reactivation, but way more, you know, I mean, there's got to be some life put in there because at this moment the territory is pretty much why don't why don't you put, why don't you move why don't you move Coachella there or Lollapalooza <laughs> why isn't it why isn't it integrated with a kind of cultural event music event something like that that would that would engender a kind of interest and in people who come to that understand just the same way you go to Coachella and pitch a tent or go to a Marriott and you stay there for three or four days and you, and you deal with that environment. So this is a kind of didactic environment, but it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any social content. There's, it has no motive other than it's what, what's driving it ecologically, it seems to me. You might so add who, also who, industry. Who's it for? You might also add, uh, I mean, it's pretty far out there, right? People aren't living there for a reason. But if you chose to live there, what are you going to do? What's your job? Where do you make the money? How does it work as an infrastructure, as a, as a urban spot? You know, you could say Century City is a place of lawyers. It's a 
used to be 20th Century Fox. There's a reason why that got popped up the way it did. Westwood has a certain logic, you know, there's even a logic to Santa Monica. And so I'm just in downtown for that matter in the history of downtown. So I do think maybe hidden in this something Eric said, which I do think is pretty provocative, is thinking of it as a kind of a re reparation project for the environment is, is noble and thoughtful. I just think the greening and you're relying on greening in Los Angeles as a solution to creating a, a place to be, I think is not entirely on par or on target with Los Angeles history and its environment. That's what I'm kind of suggesting. But I see, think the industrial landscape is, what? It's not green, it's, it's, the, it's nature and it's an environmental and it's the basis of LA. Well, he called and it a you're green later, belt, You're naming you the know, wrong towns. He called it a it's landscape. San Bernardino and Anaheim and Riverside and a series of concentrations which have multiple distributions of employment, et cetera, which is a much more complicated project. That's not, I mean, you're asking questions that ask you, could you answer these, these questions over a 15 week period? Because I'm no. looking at this and clearly the project is about a natural phenomena and utilizing these found conditions and all of this conversation connected to a Griffith Park or to a, et cetera, et cetera, to the relationship of even the discovery of the, the um, the resource of water to the to the to the to the the uh, the the, the, uh, the Pacific Ocean, etc., <clears throat> and making those broad kind of connections, which had to do with the natural environment of Los Angeles, and kind of using that as the um, the provocation for the development of this as a new urban center, and an urban center which answering Eric's question about Berkeley, which had uh, a clear interest in community building at the scale of Hermosa Beach and Manhattan Beach, et cetera, right? That we brought those three towns in. It's just, again, a beginning conversation of something that had a, um, a beginning kind of human scale, the Portland kind of interest, et cetera, right? And then it'd be made up of a multiple a series of communities, which went back to the 134 different townships that we call Los Angeles. I, I also feel like culture and stuff, um, uh, you mentioned Eric, uh, Maybe it's not about injecting it directly from before, but maybe it's created from the people that actually inhabit there in the future. So it's not something that, it's something that's kind of predetermined of like, let's say a music festival or something like that, but it's, 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 uh, it's a new identity that creates by itself um, without, without any kind of manipulation um, of any sort. And I feel like um, the uniqueness of the site, not, even if we don't look at the green, the water is very outrageous already to, to, to the context of but LA. I think, I think, Wilson, that's, I think that's absolutely right. But, you know, I, I don't think you can have a passive attitude about that. I mean, I, you know, you, oh, could, no. you could situate this as Bantam's fifth ecology, these craters. You know, and the real estate market and the finance market in LA has largely tracked upon the lifestyles of those four ecologies. That's what produces the thirst and the lust to go to those areas of LA, to go to the hills, to go to the beach, right? That's what people want that in their backyard. They wanna re-simulate that landscape and own a piece of it. Uh, so this could be a fifth one, but I would leverage history and water rights and those kind of desire lines to talk about what would get people here. I think you could leverage many of them, Wilson, and be specific about that, even if you don't have answers. There's behavioral patterns and psychoses that are specific to LA that I think absolutely would draw people to a Sonota archipelago, if that's what this becomes. The way that I would do that, and where I think there is, has been some discussion that I think um, you might want to consider, and, and I don't know, where Tom sits with this, but I think you could, I think you could concentrate everything you're doing much more around those Sonota. I'm not sure you need to connect everything between them. Um, and I wonder if there should just be more scales of those. So it's more of a pointillist strategy than one that's preemptively glued together. Um, obviously you would need some, some art arterial primary, secondary, and tertiary arterial and transit networks to glue them together. But that could be more scaffolding than, than big, um, 
you know, acreages of what you're currently coloring green and or densifying between these. I wonder if you could get it like just as a thought experiment, if you could get most of it to work in, in and around those water bodies by trying to triple or quadruple what they're doing. Um, you know, if I squint my eyes, I kind of see that in the scheme, but then there's other areas where I think you're reverting to maybe more conventional moves of stitching them together. And that's where I agree with Karen, the kind of terminology of interstitial seems to be more focused on what connects between the dots and the dots themselves doing the work. And I think mm -hmm. the dots could do more work. Um, and I think that could answer some of what Eric's bringing up and there could be cultural and historical and financial things that you could leverage from that, but it would, it would be a little more assertive in terms of going in that direction, um, which I think is a great place to be now. And it's raising a great discussion and some great questions. And I'm just suggesting that's a, it's a, it's definitely to me, the strongest asset of your scheme. So I would well, ask it to do more. Da David, just to, uh, I don't want to monopolize this. So, so the other people jump in, please. Um, what, what takes this project as I, what little I understand of it from the generic to the particular, the idiosyncrasy is the water, the association with water, Otherwise, the advocacy of water and green, the, the interrelationship of, of prior existing grids, what to do with infrastructure when it runs into the landscape. And those are those, what's appealing about those is the solution, which is an artisan solution to a problem that doesn't literally exist here. But the water question, so let me, let me ask something about the water. So th there are people who say that the ultimate solution to this, all right, go back to this. I make my city, it's London, it's Paris, it's LA, it's Shanghai, next to rivers, next to the sea, next to access to water in terms of a way to communicate in an old fashioned sense or in a way to drink something, okay? but you don't necessarily have to be next to the water that you're drinking. So it may be that the asset of this, if desalinization is not the answer or is an answer that's on the Pacific coast rather than Irwindale, that there's a whole discussion of hydrology and the processes of hydrology, either lifting water by pumps, letting it fall in terms of gravitational issues, the issue of dams, the dam is an interesting question because it suggests infrastructure, which is not solely infrastructure, but is habitable and usable in ways that don't belong to the utility of infrastructure, which is nominally or conventionally what defines infrastructure, how you move cars and how you move power, how you hold up water. So there's some interesting suggestions. So maybe the prospect <clears throat> the prospect for this has to do with a dis with a discussion on water and the use of water and the meaning of water, the moving of water, uh, hydraulic power, and all of that. That's its that's its essential asset. That's what makes it unique. And so, a venue that that explored that, investigated that, chased that dug a canal, built a dam, built a mountain, dropped the water off the mountain, whatever it would do as an experimental venue might add something unique. And then it would have a general applicability to the entire area by offering solutions that the area doesn't yet have. I would, I agree with that, but I would also pair with it that it's, it's not just the natural solution or the scientific solution, but pairing urbanism with that. And that's where this is really kind of interesting because he is essentially creating little waterfront communities. I mean, it's, it's like Venice, right? So this is the closest you can get to Venice, but now you're you know, 20, 30 miles inland. And, you know, one of the, you know, the, the dynamic aspect of this being that, um, these are craters. So any building that he does inside there 
is isn't is a tower, but it's actually it's not it's not popping up past the crater. You know, the there's such an interesting dynamic about the spaces being created here that they're completely encapsulated. Um, and it's it's really interesting. Right. It's weird because Wilson, I'm in Santorini right now, and it's the edge of a crater. It's literally your project. And it, it, as mentioned earlier, it produces a microclimate, which came up. But it, you didn't answer certain questions. The um, And it goes to some, Karen, several people said it. 90% of your development is on the water. And it's in the intensification. It's the stuff between, right? That represents the, the filler. That's part of the existing community. Okay, I think we should move the, we should move to the next one. I think we've exhausted this. Wilson, nice job. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. Thanks for other comments. I'll go next, if that's cool with everybody. Hold on a second, let me pull everything up. So a lot of the stuff Wilson's already talked about. Um, can you guys see my screen at all? Not yet. Hmm. Sure. It's, it's going to pause. We saw it and then it disappeared. Okay. Oh, can yeah. you guys see it now? Perfect. So a lot of the stuff Wilson's already talked about, like where Irwindale is and like relationship to LA. So I might skip through these really quickly. Um, so Irwindale is relatively within about 20 miles of LA. Um, it's got a pretty pretty low but high density of population, as Wilson discussed earlier with like counties like or towns like El Monte, Durate, Azusa, et cetera. Um, it's got a really low population of like 1400 people right now in comparison to like other counties and cities within the area. Um, again, it's, it's relationship to like other like infrastructural items or other cities like Long Beach, Ontario Airport, LAX, Los Angeles. Um, again, it's connections to the Metro. It's about a couple hours, depending on what time you go from LA to Irwindale. Um, it's one of three watersheds, again, the LA River, the San uh, Gabriel, and then the Santa Ana. 26% um, of the watershed is uh, urbanized right now. So it offers a, pot a potentiality for more urbanization within the area. Um, looking at like green spaces, like an item, like uh, we noticed that the average for 1,000 people is about 3.3 acres. In terms of like context that like essentially means like high density areas have less acreage where low density areas have much more. Um, Irwindale is part of a series of three rivers that connect. Um, there's about 30 cities along the San Gabriel River specifically. Um, the project looks at like a potentiality of like connecting all of those cities as well as the same, the Angeles, the Angeles National Forest and the Pacific Ocean with a green belt. There's seven zones that exist within the San Gabriel River, ranging from like the headwaters to the tidal zone and those all are specified. And there's a numerous parks that range from density or acreage. So Seal Beach, for example, is about 600, about 665 acres or so. And then Whittier Park is like 1,049, 1,492. So looking at the river and like those, those seven zones, there's actually 52 parks that exist within the San Gabriel or along the San Gabriel River. My project looks to like connect those as an infrastructural item as a way of like creating a green belt. Right now, the Santa Fe Dam has about 846 acres. I'm proposing an extra 2,000 acres to that. Um, Irwindale right now has a, a few infrastructural items, the 605, the 10, the 210, et cetera. Um, the metro is pretty expensive, though a lot of these metros are just like transit for productions or economic reasons. The Gold Line and the San, Berendi the San Bernardino Line are the ones that connect directly to Irwindale. 
Um, Irwindale has a series of pits as well as the San Gabriel River that runs through it. As Wilson discussed earlier, these pits range from various depths of 70 feet to about 200 feet. Um, with all these things in consideration, Irwindale has the like, potentiality of increasing its population by a thousand percent potentially, if not more. So my project looks at these surrounding cities and their populations as ways of pushing in to Irwindale and kind of carving out space as a way of urbanizing more. So these potentialities increase or, or potentialities allow for the populations to infiltrate, infiltrate into the area. Um, each one of these zones is its own little community as I call them. So right now I have these functions that are support for the communities and it, it's about, I wanna say like some odd million square feet my little signs in the way, 88 million square feet. Um, the total housing in the project is 115 million square feet. And then this work, what I call work is where the densification, the urbanization is essentially is what we call cities exists within the pits. So it's about 25 million square feet. Um, so if we consider it as we're using 100% of the land, I'm taking up only 35% of the land. Um, each pit ranges in densification from like Tokyo all the way to Bangkok. As a total though, it's, it can be densified as much as a Taipei. So community one offers us probably the least amount of uh, densification. Um, it's total built area is about 25.8 uh, million square feet, offers us 35% open space. Um, as Wilson had discussed earlier, the pits do drop about 200 feet. So it allows us for an opportunity to build up, but also down as well. So we can cap our buildings in about 200 feet, allowing for a seamless skyline as you go through, but also like allowing for moments of uh, extrusions that go past that zone. Uh, community two is the second smallest. It's at 33.4 total built area, but with about a 40% open area. Um, again, the same conditions arise where we can get that opportunity of more densif densification. This pit specifically drops about 200 feet. Um, community three is much more dense, 45% uh, open space with a 58.6 million square feet uh, total built area. Uh, again, same conditions. Community four is the densest of all of them. It has an open space of 54. 50%, but a total built area of 25.8 million square feet. Um, again, this is where the most densification occurs within the pit. Uh, there's a series of towers. I, I took Brooklyn, I mean not Brooklyn, but uh, Lower Manhattan specifically as a model for understanding of how this densification could occur. And then community five is 40% open space with 40.5 million square feet of built area. And with that, we get the seamless like ability to view the skyline as both natural and occurring as a seamless transition of about 35 feet in total height from zero, but then you get moments of extrusions of the urban fabric itself. And then looking at that again as those community drivers, as they penetrate and carve out space within Irwindale specifically, we're, we're left over with a transitional green space. And I know we've just discussed how much we don't like that word transitional, so I'm just called green spaces now. Um, the total green space that I'm proposing is about 151.3 million square feet. Um, right now, Irwindale has about 836 acres of, your, of, of uh, landscape, which is primarily the Santa Fe Dam. Um, I'm proposing an excess, again, of 2,000 square feet of that. However, within that, I'm also proposing other parts of green space, whether it's secondary parks, which is about 10.1 million square feet, or courtyard spaces that exist within the fabric of the housing. So these courtyard spaces are both private and public, depending on how the orientation of the project works. It offers us like 200 acre, 202 acres of potential new green space, as well as uh, green pathways that also double as pedestrian walkways and et cetera. That's about 23.5 million square feet. Um, and then as Wilson touched again, these pits are pretty massive. Some of them range from three quarters of a mile in length, if not more. Um, 
my project looks at it as 116 million square feet of open water space. And with that breakdown, as we've discussed, 35% is land use. So then the next space is 65% open space, which is equivalent to about four central parks. And then looking at vehicular transportation and how it connects to the, the communities all together, um, the Metro would run along from the existing gold line and run through the project, creating different stops along the support spaces. Um, the major stop would be in the middle that connects to the, to the fourth, I mean, the third community. Do you think at uh, 10 o'clock? And then looking at like how the existing conditions, uh, the San Gabriel bike path already runs through there. So connecting to that along with the other pedestrian circulation. And then finally, what Irwindale could potentially be is a vast open space that allows for urbanization as well as the increase of a hundred thousand plus people. And that's my project. That's it. Um, okay, Lawrence, nobody says anything. I'm saying something right away. I have a big it. deja vu here, um, which is having spent most of my life in Berlin, I'm seeing a lot of blocks, um, edges of blocks. Um, you were talking about the potential of the courtyards, um, which, yes, are there, but uh, debatable. The courtyards, green and courtyards, it's either really good or it's really bad. Yes. Um, I'm interested in how you imagine the spaces between those blocks, between those edges, because as it looks, it seems that every block is defining exactly the edges. And so we have streets in between. Um, now, if we are looking at a city in the near future with a different type of transportation, where maybe the focus on the city, uh, on the street is a different one, uh, is that still the way we want to go? No, I don't think so. What, what is that space between the blocks? Not the courtyard, but the other one. Okay. I mean, is that the Hilbersheimer on various levels? Is it the corridor, the shady corridor? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what the potential of that space is and if there is potential. I think there is potential. Like I would argue that there's always potential because like for me, this project is entirely prototypical. Um, it has the potential to move around and change in different ways. And I agree with you, like with the advancements of like our transportation system, this would change immediately. I don't imagine these as being extremely like corridor driven, like let's say like a Barcelona block in the Gothic region where it's like super dense and the streets are super narrow and it feels like a corridor. I would imagine these spaces being much more open or having the potentiality for being much more open. Or at least that's like okay. the- So thing. then maybe it's a visualization problem, right? It probably yeah, is. Absolutely. At this moment, it, it really looks very, very- um, It's very gridded. It's very- gridded. Gridded. Exactly. Right so now, right? if, if you're saying these blocks are porous, which could be fantastic and which, um, you know, there are examples of that um, that work very well. Um, so that actually these courtyards are not private courtyards, but they would be public, yeah. semi-public, you could walk it through them public. and so on. Then I think the way you visualize this is a different, uh, it should be different. Um, mm -hmm. It should show that and, uh, and the focus should be really on this porous um, transition space and, and the movement that goes through it. I'm going to switch to my mirror, but no, Karen, I agree with you. I think that's a total potentiality because... Uh, that's what I had envisioned for the project as both a public and private space existing as one within mm -hmm. terms of like the courtyards themselves. Um, hold on a second, I'm searching to my mirror now. Um, but that, I wonder, that, Lawrence. Uh, what was that? I, I just had one observation that, that I will share and see if it, it's kind of maybe building upon some of Karen's comments. Can you go back to the plan that you showed? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry if my computer um, lags for a second. I mean, my cold read of your scheme, if I did not hear you talk about a thing, would be that this has something to do with leveraging and amplifying 
the concept of wilderness bridges or corridors for non-human species. It could. Uh, and so I think if you basically um, understand that there is a fundamental confrontation happening in the hills of LA already and, pro and a problem of getting um, ecologies to move off of the mountains and, and inhabit other areas. Um, you could see an urbanism that is about kind of embracing the wild, getting yep. those two things to cohabitate in a much more aggressive way. Let's no, say. Absolutely. And, and, and to me, this looks kind of like a huge, um, you know, wilderness corridor, which I find super exciting. Um, it, it answers, if that's what it could be, that answers a lot of why I'd be shrinking the footprint of the human population. Um, you know, and it, it essentially, potentially opens up a whole other mode of transit in the city that's not there. It's a kind of uh, viaduct for animals, if you will, um, that is threading them through and in and around neighborhoods that, you know, I mean, I'm not, I am not a, a wildlife or forest manager, but I could imagine that there's lots of things in terms of fire prevention, diminishing growth and other um, uh, parts of just the ecological management of LA that could be interesting, but also the kind of, you know, there is, I think there is a marketable side to that. You know, oh, like no, everybody, no. everybody goes up to the mountains to try to go see bears. Um, you know, there's a whole culture of kind of engaging wildlife in LA that- I cut you that, off, David, but I would agree with you on that. Like um, on our site visit, I had talked to some individuals that were bird watching and apparently yeah. there's like over 200 different bird species that infiltrate the, the Los Angeles or the Angeles National Forest, but they congregate within the lake in the center of Irwindale. And yeah. on some, like upon some other research that there's actually a flight pattern for bird species that goes right through this area. But so, I think this is a... But this a, is like a just, further step, though. Like, yeah, I think you could... You could, like the next step. you could leverage it. I mean, I think, you know, Rem's show at the Guggenheim, as interesting as it was, the countryside show, I think it kind of got it wrong. No disrespect, but, you know, it sure. continued the... It continued the genus loci radial model that the countryside yeah. is still outside of the city. Mm -hmm. um, you could kind of flip that on its head and say, you know, the countryside's downtown. This is this is the kind of I am legend landscape of the future Los Angeles, and we're going to live with this. Um, and and I have to say, and this may sound very weird to people who haven't lived there, but. It is one of the most incredible things about Hong Kong, which also has the highest concentrated density in the world and is the only city currently hitting the mm. target for consumption that the Paris Accord has leveled because of that concentrated density. It lives on only one third of its land. Two thirds of it is a big, you know, I've run into pythons when I was hiking my dog around there. I mean, there's, there's boars that are running around parts of downtown Hong Kong where people are like going to Louis yes. Vuitton to shop. You know, two-legged I mean, two two boars. <laughs> also, yes. But I mean, I think that kind of, to me, that kind of, that's like what I see in the graphic here, Lawrence. And, and the almost, almost um, fort-like, you know, the things that were freaking Karen out, the things that would talk about the ballistic formation of a city as it's defending itself against wildlife. I think, you know, how porous that is and how much you're tinkering with that, I think could be super interesting. But you're kind of, I guess I see this as kind of smearing the hills into the city. That's, bringing, what you know, That's exactly what I want to do is I want to find a way, like what, I guess what Gary's kind of considering is connecting the existing conditions of the Angeles Mountains and connecting it directly to the Pacific Ocean. Finding a way of increasing that, what we consider natural, whatever the definition we want to use as natural, as a way of linking the two. 
Um, there seems to be in our urban conditions a really resistance of allowing the natural setting for occurring in our systems, whether it's deer or bears as some sort of unwanted behavior to me that seems very negligent. And though I never consider this within the project specifically, like discussing with Tom, I, I would very much be on board with that. Lawrence, you, you know, know, I think it'd be important based on uh, Karen, what you started with, <clears throat> to really define, I'd like to move the conversation a little bit. Um, the first project was absolutely developing a new center Yes, as one of the 134 different communities, right? And that was the focus and the, the, the landscape and the connective tissue of the river was secondary. Yours from the very beginning was an interested in developing the, the, the river as a continuous recreation spine. But what happened that we really never got to in a conversation, which is really interesting here, which we'd have to talk about. You've, and, and with that, Irwindale was never talked about in any important way as a town. It's just a site. It's it exactly. totally neutral. It has no interest at all and no population, et cetera, et cetera. It's a site, which made it in some ways very typical of first growth communities in Los Angeles that have to do with 134, what we call communities, right? And but what you did finally is you eliminated it. Instead of adding a one, th uh, um, if, if Wilson added a new, a new town to the mix, that it became 135, you took one away and you're, you've allowed three, four different communities to expand yes. and connect to this resource. That's the macro conversation here. You yeah, know, I, couldn't have been a more opposite approach to actually making a new place. You actually allowed the, the, the you, you responded to the four communities around this and they're both expanding <clears throat> based on the characteristic of these found sites. Exactly. But then the response, the response, which allow them to grow in very different ways, and the, and then they 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 connect to this major resource. These but, you've you started and and, um, the, and you showed us all the towns all the way down. You've given us the prototype of the first four towns as they connect to this major recreational landscape ecological resource. Am I correct? But the, the logical that's step. The big, that that's the big argument. If. If there's a logical step that follows from that discourse, it's if you put the two projects together, because the first one, the first one was a point or a city as a dot, although not much there. And this is the old, the city as a line. And the question is, is a city as a line running somewhere or nowhere? It's conceivable the first scheme is the destination point at the end of, of the second scheme. But what I would say, and it, it, what, what makes this conversation to some extent difficult and inaccessible in the first place, a lot of the statistics that are, that are read off, in other words, I have X amount of, of acres of green or Y amount of, of, of housing and office that adjoins the river. And nobody knows, I say nobody knows, I don't know if the numerology is good or bad. It's like saying, you know, I have a temperature without knowing at what point the temperature tells me I have COVID or I don't. So I don't know, if our, and this is just a conversational, as these projects are presented, and as statistics are laid out without, without being conversant in why they're good or why they're not so good. The other thing I would say is there are these four small towns and it seems to me, or five, whatever it is, and that each one of those could have been a prototype for a very different way of agglomerating, organizing. It seems to me, without disrespecting the, the, the sort of architectural specifics, that the solutions to the pieces that adjoin the river are, are conceptually all the same. No, I and agree. They, and they, they, anticipate, they anticipate, as opposed to saying, here's what I won't do 
what I did in the first town, because I don't know. I mean, if I if I open up the, the newspaper tomorrow, somebody tells me, oh, everybody's moving out of the city or everybody's working remotely or everybody's looking for small towns to live in or whatever the hell it is. So what's fascinating about the conversation is, is this is really a moving target and the intellectual acuity of the result or the solution might be to say, we don't know and therefore we will try A, B, C, D, and E, as opposed to saying, here's a line, here are five points on the line, and we will repeat ourselves five times. I agree with that. I, I like absolutely agree with that. I, I don't have a comment beyond that, to be honest with you. Can, can you explain your border lines around each of these little urban neighborhoods. You created almost like a city wall. I mean, I, you know, first, I mean, I do like the nodal concept. I think it's exquisitely strong. I think it could have an interesting organic growth concept to it as well. You do represent your ideas with mini Manhattans and I guess, you know, uh, Mediterranean courtyards, which seems questionable for Los Angeles. But I guess my most troubled thought or question, maybe not even a trouble, why are you building a massive wall around the territories to protect the wilderness, quote unquote? Well, I don't think protecting the wilderness is necessarily an idea. I think that's just a provocation from the conversation we've just had. Um, the wall has been something that I've been like apprehensive about and I haven't been able to figure out how to resolve beyond it right now. Um, to be honest, I was more concerned with other aspects of the project moving forward right now. Uh, the but, reason so why did you build a wall? So the reason why they are there right now is that they are more in line as like an outline for what the communities could be as a potentiality. Um, I'm not sure if it was discussed earlier, but the slope of the project over a course of a couple miles changes drastically to about 100 feet. So there's an in increase in the drop of the topography. So for me, like, as I'm looking at this project as this is a support system and I'm having a metro station go through there, I need to kind of keep it somewhat in line with itself, at, like at least at some sort of zero and maybe I'm wrong in that thinking. And that was just the resolution I came to within the project. I, I understand your, your logics then, but I do think it's a representational challenge to you because it does suggest these little walled in 18th century, 19th century city types, of course, of you know, course. which I don't think is the power of your scheme. The power of your scheme is to take these little waterways and to build up carefully in those territories with high density, uh, which is a provocation, and then arguably recreate the, the natural water lands that existed a long time ago, no. which, is, which is powerful. Again, I, you know, to everybody, I still find the green um, a problem color for the choice that you're using, but I, I do understand what you're after. So I, I do get that. No, I mean, and I also understand where you're coming from because like looking at it, like the size of those balls, it's just extreme. And it just, it, it immediately like represents itself as some sort of walled in city. And that's never necessarily good within architecture. Like these communities want it's, it's an argument. You just have yeah. to own it. So you just have to make a decision why you love that because it does have a futuristic quality as much as it has an 18th century or 16th, probably 13th century quality. Oh, okay. So, okay, but, but Lawrence, can you probably, uh, I, I might have missed it, but what is happening in these walls? We, we know the dam wall is the dam wall, but the, the other walls that you are introducing here, is, do you know what's happening in them? I, I would assume this would be like more support because I have like three different things like work, housing, and then support. Um, work and housing kind of like are self-explanatory in that regard, but like support would be the things that aren't attainable, like maybe grocery stores. Um, it's like an allegorical edge at Lawrence, yeah. right? It's just a placeholder. <laughs> Or next yeah, month. Yeah, so in, in theory, it yeah, could be green, right? Be it could be. I, I, it was more or less like a way of finding the placement for things like schools, shopping, commercial use, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, I didn't get to that nitty gritty within the project. Like, I just didn't. Like, I didn't find myself 
into like what is a school, what is a hospital, what is a store, et cetera. So those are as a placement for those. Well, Lawrence, okay, I mean, listen, this is, a, this is a great scheme. Um, you know, like if you're looking at the LA River, uh, the LA River is divided into these uh, six groupings called re reaches, right? And it has to navigate over like 20 different cities and 20 different jurisdictions. So trying to basically get 20 different governments, city halls to align to kind of participate in this one gigantic digestive system, that's the LA River has been a, a nightmare. Uh, but here, I think the LA, uh, but the, the, the San Gabriel uh, River Valley, I think has maybe half of the jurisdiction. So there's a higher uh, capacity and a potential for this to actually be a proof of concept for a regional jurisdictional strategy, right? So I, I kind of applaud your, uh, your regional st strategy on this. Um, I think other than that, I think uh, you're very well aware of uh, perhaps a lost opportunity, which has to do with uh, your scheme very much participating and contributing to the current global discourse mm -hmm. of actually um, urbanization as being a net positive and restorative. So that's right now where everything shifted. You know, like the 20th century was all about separation, right? Yeah. You know, preservation and separation. And now there's a huge discussion actually brought on by the landscape uh, urbanist group of actually bringing cities um, intervening like you um, to actually be stewards, guardians, right? In a much more of a, of a holistic uh, way. And it would have been interesting if you actually kind of took on actually ironically the strategy that uh, Kisho Kurokawa did for his um, agricultural uh, cities for the metabolis where he just simply floated another mechanism on top of it. It was just actually literally floating on top and almost just delicately touching the touching and farming uh, the agriculture uh, from the top down, right? Just yeah. with like delicate pincers. Uh, and maybe that our attitude, I think would have gone a long way, but that's now that's moving to a realm of architecture. But if you could just like shift this more toward um, these insertions being much more of, a, of, a, of being a stewards, right? Of nature um, as part of this larger uh, kind of like digestive tract that's going to be um, the Daly River Basin. I think that's going to go a long way in terms of merging urbanism with uh, with larger jurisdictional issues right now that's emerging. So, I agree. Nice scheme. You know, uh, just uh, northeast of here is a place called the uh, San Dimas Experimental Forest. I uh, visited it earlier this summer. It was fascinating. Uh, it's largely uh, abandoned. There's a skeleton crew there. And it was established uh, before any of this uh, L.A that we know has, was built. Because uh, when the first uh, uh, attention came to this region, uh, no one could figure out how the hell water was working uh, because we were used to East Coast uh, stuff and how watersheds on the East Coast operate. And uh, a lot of knowledge was produced right here in the San Gabriel Valley about how water moves through, from the mountains uh, and then ultimately draining out to the ocean. Uh, one of the consequences of this was uh, channelization mm -hmm. of uh, the LA and the San Gabriel uh, rivers, which was never a great solution. You know, this is like mid-century logic, just let's just fix uh, the floods that are happening uh, so people don't die. Uh, we have seemingly enough water. Uh, they didn't anticipate what the drought situation might be like in 2021 and basically made a freeway for water. You know? So I, I mentioned this because there might be uh, you know, other possible logics of dealing with the hydrology of the LA region. So uh, what looks almost like a bit of a contradiction for me is your medieval fortifications, right? Protect the human settlements <laughs> uh, but, uh, from wilderness, but then you still have this channelized river, which I presume, you know, remains. Yeah. Like what I, I think uh, you have a very straightforward possibility of maybe removing that water freeway and letting uh, this area flood a bit. You know, and then, which would then require some you know, uh, embankments to be built around uh, the higher concentration of uh, settlements that, would, that you're proposing, you know. But uh, then it could become like a lung, you know, like it periodically floods every year. And then maybe you truly do have something like a wilderness, meaning uh, we don't 
you know, we acknowledge uh, the right to exist of the non-human and whether it's green or not, uh, you know, same, same question about the mountains. It's not entirely green either. You know? No. But that there's some other kind of acknowledgement and respect to some process beyond the human that uh, you are making space for. Yeah. Uh, I think this has a lot of political, uh, uh, I guess, uh, sympathy, you know, this way of thinking today. You know, like uh, the infrastructure bill uh, looks like it's going to be passed. It's going to be billions of dollars now that are going to go into carbon capture facilities and things like that, uh, which uh, might actually find a good home in areas like this. You know, so it's not, that's not grass, you know. I mean, no, carbon course, capture facilities, they look like refineries, actually, you know. But it is yeah. sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and burying it, you know. So there may be a lot of this kind of possibility that could be a plausible argument to make for why densification might happen in areas like this. No, I, I agree with that. Like, I, I guess I should apologize for, like, making this, like, all green in some aspects. It's just, like, a, a visualization. Because um, to your point, David, like, the, the mountains aren't all green. They're, they're brown sometimes. They're whatever color they want to be. But I think it does offer the uh, potentiality of those things like you're talking about, the carbon capture with the new infrastructure bill that's going through. Like what, what if this city was that capacity? But it would look totally different. It would be a different city altogether. You know, what's weird one, is, one, uh, yeah. one item that occurred to me uh, with respect to the point about the uh, city wall, city gate, kind of conception is that if the green were, uh, if, if that zone between the walls were a wetlands, so it was a combination of a variety of kinds of, of animal life and plant life and it varied all over the place. And the wall, which wouldn't necessarily be a wall, but would be a line of demarcation so you couldn't intrude on the wetland but the wetland life would be so that those walls essentially are dams the wetland ends the city venues begin yeah. as opposed to that and 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 that might work conceptually and visually i think it makes more sense the other implication is that for all the talk about the limits of master planning and the short-sightedness of master planning and issues of growth and for that matter, shrinkage of cities. What it looks like is go this far, go no further. This is the beginning, the middle and the end. And it doesn't anticipate solving any of the problems it's designed to solve. In other words, if this deals with growth, when these pieces of growth are complete then you start all over again. So there may be another discussion is if you can't expand into the wetlands, there's another piece of the issue that it's that is the contiguous side with the existing urban context and and where the wall ends uh, and the continuity between the new piece of the city and the old piece of the city and you can expand into that. So that gives you at least a venue for adding to the, to the density of these new pieces that don't allow the growth for which the concept presumably is intended. That's a lot to take in, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the project as it stands right now definitely has like some sort of cap on growth at least as like a visual marker. Um, again, for me though, this is just a prototype as like a way of saying this is one of how many ever there could be. Um, we could expand the pits potentially, potentially and add more urban growth, or we could even subsidize, subsidize some of the housing and add some urban growth and go more vertical. Um, those, those options are very present, at least like that's how I feel like with this project is that there's a continual growth that could occur, whether or not vertically or even in the X, Y, and Z as a way of infiltrating more into the green space. I think that's just an, it's, it's an option is how I would say. 
but I would I think say that's you're stepping all back so, from your power. It ought to be included in the conceptual diagram. So if it grows in those ways, it ought to be indicated in one of these venues how that might take place. Agreed. There is power, though, in the way you've argued that density is an answer to sprawl and expansion. So there is something really provocative, as much as I kind of keyed in on the wall, a, a commitment to understanding it also makes this argument that now we need density because we're going to leave actually some territories for the natural environment versus sprawl endlessly or find other ways to infiltrate it. And that's what's powerful about what you're suggesting. So I think, I think this is very interesting all, all around. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, going back to Eric's comment, like I, that's just one of those things that like I can like look back upon and be like, oh, I wish I would have done that for the sake of it. Unfortunately, I didn't and I didn't get to that point. I wouldn't be totally yeah. afraid of walls. I think there's many of us that have spent time on top of the Aurelian wall and it's pretty kick ass. So the anxiety of walls, while there's recent political history that attributes to our collective anxieties about that, not all walls are bad. <laughs> so I wouldn't, you know, I think there's ways you could work that edge to be something exciting. I think there's just a connotation with walls. Like most of us think of walls as some sort of like border in which defines space and allows people to move or not move. It's, an, it's more or less like an access thing. So like I understand like the discretion when it comes to like these walls as some sort of negative connotation, like absolutely. I've never been to the wall that you're specifically talking about, but be cool. All right, Lawrence, I think in a strategical sense, which this developed quite late, the real conversation would be now a continuation of the project. It would have to do with the consequences of expanding these four, these four um, communities and the meaning of that expansion, which would include radical um, recentering and intensification and density, which Absolutely. is part of, Stephen, of the bigger project. There's no question it's going to get denser. The notion is the nature of that density. Right, in its distribution and its type having to do with it. And that statistics are given. There's absolutely, it's, it's the specifics of it in terms of the exact number, yes, a question mark. The notion of the expansion of 1.5, different people will tell you it's 2.5, but there's no question it will expand, right? Yep. And this offers a very, very different strategical approach than the first project. We've got to move on to the next one. Nice job, Lawrence. Thank you. Thanks everybody for the comments. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen now? Um, so I'm Faye. Um, I'm, pre I'm presenting my scheme that I call the new Up um, Opendale New Open Center. Uh, I believe um, my classmates gave enough brief on Opendale's history and background. It's an industry city with a small population around a few thousand and some of its mining pits are still in use and the, its depths vary 100 um, feet. Um, to give a large, large um, scale con uh, contest, Owendale's location um, plays an important role um, of expanding the blue and green um, corridor as a geocenter connecting the mountain to river. Um, also, there's a few aerial um, showing show as the black cross in the map, um, describing the population density around Irvingdale, and within the 20, um, the larger, the larger, largest uh, radius circle, within this 20 miles um, circle, the, the den densest areas are K Town, Hollywood, and um, downtown area. So um, the density, as you can tell, the density, the density um, distribution is not even here. And by considering of its, um, uh, its advantage of significance, uh, location and the nature resource, uh, I'm thinking why not to create a new um, city center um, with, high, with high density to allow more um, urban growth. 
And this is a small uh, scale showing uh, surrounding cities and it's more clear to see uh, how it connects the mountain and the river. Um, this shows the major roads connections and the Metro Golden Line uh, going through our, our, our sites and also a few um, airports around. So again, due to its um, geography location advantage um, from um, Urbandale to other parts of the city, only needs like 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and here is the, the site as in the red dash line. The total land area is around 9.6 um, mile and site build area is about um, 4.7 miles. And our population target is 100,000. Um, before I'm going, uh, before I dig into the design, I'd like to share some of my um, case studies that inspired my scheme. And again, jump to this uh, density map again. Since LA has long claimed as a, um, um, as a poor planning city with random sprawl, urban sprawl. Um, so with, and uh, also with the population increasing, the dream type of this um, single, single family cannot be kept as much as before, um, except um, also, there are a few, few um, dense area in LA to allow um, the high-rise towers to be suited and cre um, creating more job opportunities and also to reduce the um, existing urban centers pressure. Um, it will not only um, reduce the urban um, pressure, urban center pressure also, it can um, also can um, kind of activated this um, almost um, that kind of that industry city with very small um, population. So the first uh, case uh, should be the um, lot of funds. Um, as I believe uh, people uh, all will know, it's the most dense um, business district that uh, locates uh, in Paris that has um, super, super dense. It's a super dense area with more um, hyper um, towers uh, in the downtown area. Um, from this case, it's also can, can see the um, relationship between the um, towers and the natures. And also um, the, the, um, from the circulation diagram like this one, you, um, the most inspiring thing is the, the men's buy in the middle, um, it allows all the traffic, all the transition happen on the ground rather than on the ground. And here is a, a large loop ring road to connect all parts together. Um, so by um, by judging from the population, um, it's more like a f our side is more like four times about uh, four times of a lot of fun. Um, another case is the central city, central city. The reason I look into this is because it has an interesting pattern with uh, shown as two uh, giant parks at the end and with the city in, the be in between. And also there is a main spine axis in the middle, the towers are along, the, along this main spine. And another case is the well, um, Velshai um, Boulevard um, it's also about the more, I'm more digging to the um, relationship between the main axis with the high rise tower and the single family housing uh, relationship. So men, mostly they are um, towers along the main road, then the single families um, behind it with pool. With pool. Um, so I'm thinking to respect, to incorporate all these ideas and the respect the existing LA um, fabric to the design. And so here's the simple diagram. So the, the side uh, boundary and we uh, deducted, de deduct the um, existing pits and lakes. So uh, rather than um, developing these pits areas, I'm thinking to deduct it from the site to keep it as um, nodes and uh, develop as a more nature and green area and serving for the in for serving for this in-between city area. 
and also um, inspiring by those cases, the men, there will be a men spine axis and also a loop uh, ring road and also um, a city grid extending from the city uh, urban uh, fabric. Um, so here is the, uh, how, the, how to extend the uh, existing grid to the side and the um, vehicle circulation based on this, uh, based on this idea. And the, uh, uh, along, this, uh, the, along this golden line metro line, um, I'm thinking to have a new lines to connect this whole long linear um, urban area, urban city within uh, about five minutes walking distance. Um, and following the, following the uh, grid, the green, uh, green color shows as the pedestrian circulation and the uh, orange um, loop as the bike cycling pass. Um, along, the, along, the, along this main spine, um, there will be the most uh, tall buildings, varies from 120 to 30, 100 meters, and other uh, uh, different heights of buildings distribute um, along along this area. With uh, with also with uh, different programs um, with, uh, needed necessary needed, um, and this is the um, green relationship three uh, high, kind of hierarchy, the park, the existing park and the small eight parks and the with inside um, street kind of strip, strip green and the outer connection. Also along this main access, there will be a few um, plaza open space like the large funds to allow some transition happen um, to uh, um, evacuate as well. Um, and uh, along here, uh, this, uh, this uh, rectangle is the uh, reference from a walkability city, a walkability, a walkability module. Um, it's kind of like one, one quarter of it, it um, the module here. Um, so uh, it accommodate, it only accommodate um, 20,000 um, per um, two um, square kilometer. And within this, each module, it will have, it will have like, open plazas, open space plazas, and uh, single families, one to two um, floors, and uh, three, to, three to six floors, um, courtyard housing, and the high rise towers along the, along the axis and the plaza area. So uh, with um, along the our side, it will be around six, about six module size. Um, and each module can be act can be freely arranged to uh, to offer um, diverse density according to different scenario. For example, like if um, it can be distributed evenly distributed with twenty thousand the population in each square. Also, you can play play around with it. Like this one has lower density and this one has higher. But how? Uh, but each module will have those necessary function uh, needed, and each um, square will be um, five five minutes walking distance to any part, to anywhere. Um, and uh, there are some perspectives. So uh, the the three main access points. Um, there are the parks along, uh, arrival parks along, shown as two, three, five and other parks with different, um, defined as different functions, um, parks. And, and uh, here again, here is the plaza in, along the plaza along the main, main um, spine. And here are the uh, three to six um, courtyard housing. This is the strip green and the mixed use high rise building, including office, res residential apartment, and uh, um, these are these along the street green are single family housing about one or two floors and the dam and the, the um, pedestrian pass. Um, then there are just some um, shots of it. Um, looking uh, from the um, parks looking towards to the mountain. Again, a close shot um, to show the 
relationship between the single family house, high 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 rise towers, and uh, um, Koya housing. Okay, Sim similar um, angle showing the skyline as well. Yeah, basically that's uh, that's pretty much I have. Thank you. Hey, um, can you speak a little bit more about um, this radical difference between the single family house and the high rise? I think that's very interesting um, as the two opposite forms that are very typical also for Los Angeles. I think what yeah. will be interesting now today uh, and for the near future city is what is the, the new um, that comes in with these towers and single family houses, where are they different from what the city already has at this moment? And right now, I, I, I don't actually um, clear, differentiate it from the existing fabric. I'm more like borrowing from the existing, um, existing conditions. Like I, um, that's why I show these um, cases. I look into mm -hmm. like the Versailles Boulevard. It has this, you know, um, the high rise along the uh, axis and the single family house behind it. And I think right. it's, a, it's a good, it's a very good way to cap, to cap the both, to allow um, both um, urban growth and cap to some um, quality uh, single family housing type. And I think it has a great potential to grow in the future as well for at least a few, uh, 30, few uh, 30, 20 years. The oh, difference is, that's a, it's an interesting example. The difference, you didn't do that though. What goes on on Wilshire Boulevard from what little I know is there's a line on the north side of the street, on the south side of the street, it runs roughly from Westwood to Beverly Hills of high buildings on either side of the street, one by one, not in mass and so on. And then not to say this is good or bad, but it's a distinction and the distinction ought to be elaborated on. And then north of that line of buildings that align Wilshire or the uh, north or south side of Wilshire is, is long distances of single family houses. So you have a vertical line and then you have a substantial horizontal zone. I think what it looks like in your project is, is an admixture of densities that occur simultaneously, which would be different. In other words, for Wilshire to be analogous, more high rise buildings, helter skelter, would have to show up in the midst of the residential single family stuff, if you wanted to do that. But it seems yeah. to me that's a, that's a discussion. The other thing has to do with the relationship of towers to each other. So the tower, which is disposed singly, I guess is all obvious to everyone. You look south and you see for a long way, you look north and you see a long way, and you look east or west and you bump into the, the character who's next to you. That's a very different organizational hypothesis than what you're offering. So all I'm saying is it's, it's quite different than, than the Wilshire Boulevard model except for the association of something very small with something very large, which is an interesting discussion in and of itself. Right. <laughs> there is a, yeah. um, hey, I just wanna ask you about something. I'm, I mean, I see overlapping issues across the three of you so far. And I think there's a huge amount of great work here. I, I'm curious about one assumption that it seems that you've made and particularly given the Wilshire Boulevard analogy, I find it a strange choice. Um, uh, if I consider that the freeway, the street, Wilshire Boulevard works as a kind of analogy, but 
it seems like the big edges, uh, like in the last scheme, are actually um, these interfaces and these mm -hmm. edges of exchange. And, um, you know, it, it looks to me right now like sectionally you are building up toward the center and going back out to those edges. You know, there's no yeah. density out here or out here. You're pushing it all back. So yeah. if this is the street, if I understand these as street or buffer zones, you're, you're basically making more kind of friendly sidewalk space in here. Now, what I find weird about that, what's so interesting about Wilshire and, and um, you know, the two cities that I know this of the most frequently, although there's a third, are Tokyo and Taipei. Beijing has remnants of it. It's part of the Imperial Chinese defense model, but you know, Tokyo has huge perimeter blocks of like 30 to 40 story towers. So does Taipei, um, which puts all the density here. And they argue for all of the softness being in here. So one of the coolest things about a Motosanto or some of the, you know, just most urbanistically vital areas and night markets in Taipei is they happen actually between big perimeter blocks of larger towers. And in Taiwan, those are specifically huge colonnades, um, kind of urban uh, uh, colonnades that are part of the Japanese um, and Chinese imperial plan. And uh, you know, I, I wonder if that's a way to think about some of the issues we were bringing up in Lawrence's project and in yours that, you know, because this isn't really a street, right? I mean, this is a freeway, isn't it? Yeah, that's the freeway. But yeah. here, so, um, behind it, just, there is a main axis. What led you to the assumption mm -hmm. that, that, that density around the freeway, or maybe you can speak more to it, or maybe I missed it, why that's the right uh, solution here because I could I could see a real argument for going the opposite way but I, I don't really want to make that up for your scheme I'm just curious why you why you think condensing on the freeway is the bed the best option well I I think because you know um, maybe most of these high-rise buildings will have um, office buildings and com commands areas as well so it's, it's not um, necessarily to locate residential towers along the highway. So you can avoid, reduce the noise, um, reduce the noise uh, impact. Also, yeah, I suppose I could flip also, it. I could try to flip it in your scheme and say that's the perimeter block. It's a combination of the freeways and these edges, these arced edges and that you're basically trying to argue for the soft space being in here. That, that might be a different way to understand yeah. it, but um, yeah, cool. that could would be mean that this would, this would need to be as dense as this though, for that to work. I only, I only bring this up because right now it, it, it seems to be a very North American model of giving me more curb by the park to kind of push the density away from the park. I would say rather than a Asian model, which uses the density and the perimeter to kind of trap the park, you know, mm. that, that's what you find, that, that's what makes, um, I think Taiwan, uh, sorry, Taipei and Tokyo so different. No, Hong Kong doesn't follow this, but Tokyo and Taipei do. Beijing has mm. some of it, but the, you know, their, their edges are super tall and then they have basically you know, like, like exactly as Karen was talking about, they have like three story, I mean, it's not single family houses, but you know, Amoto Santo where Kuma's coffee shop and all that stuff is, those are all like three story buildings surrounded by huge fields of towers, which gives it a very, very interesting urbanity. And, and I guess, um, you know, I don't know that maybe that's a direction you were avoiding, but Right. Interest seems to be in this texture. And I think, yeah, there are just other ways you could deal with the density 
that may not necessarily just be on the street. It may be more of a perimeter block model, just as, as one this conversation one is yeah, also, I think absolutely that's... fantastic. Can, can you go to your last pictures where you really show the three-dimensional field? Uh, it's really just easier to talk about it, Can any of them. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, mine's the question on zoning and the social politics of zoning. Um, and maybe in your choice of the single family versus let's say a low rise model or even a mid rise model. And I'm only putting that out because there's already a challenge going on in Los Angeles as there is um, surrounding you know, wealth associated with single family housing uh, that has pressures in urban environments not to uh, open up for multifamily situations. The governor, of course, has altered that with ADUs and JADUs, but still it's nowhere near what could happen. And I'm really curious. I mean, I like your scheme a lot. I just want to put that out there. Um, it's an interesting, I'm not sure how different it is from some of the schemes you've seen historically, but the idea of you know a high rise in a green space. But the way in which you've made it bilateral, like a little bit like um, Park La Brea. Park La Brea is high rises, but they're low rise apartments, garden apartments. Uh, I don't think there's a typology of person that's specifically different that chooses to live in one or the other uh, in terms of base of class and um, income. But this model does pose certain things that I wonder why the single family gets the, the low rise green space environments, as David just pointed out, close to the park edge mm -hmm. conditions, while another population is living in the high rise, which of course have views, uh, views that of course can be emulated from the hillsides. But I'm wondering what, a, what social politic you're suggesting in all of that. And maybe you, you can elaborate a little bit. Actually, I think it's um, it's coming from my personal prefer preference, as I um, personally I believe like single family house typing is better than high rise building in terms of you know in enjoying the nature, sunshine, whatever, um, nature, a resource, and lights. Um, however, the high rise building is kind of neg negative part, and that's why I think that's why particularly I intuitively just put it along the highway. So to combine like combine the negative parts together and to make the best use of the uh, space to give it to the um, low rise buildings um, for enduring more um, sunshine and... Um, um, so I would ask you, it's your journey through life to question that politic. I only question it because if you say, I think it's a better environment to be in low rise single family or low rise environments closer to green space. But I understand density is a requirement for the increased population of the world to avoid sprawl. Who goes in the high rise and that that high rise is going to be located on an infrastructural network. It's a bit like our TOC rules in the city. It's pretty much a certain population is forced into those environments. And I just question it. It doesn't mean that a high rise isn't going to in New York City uh, incite or desire for uh, wealthy people living at the top of the building. It's just, there's a politic that you are posing of how people are going to live their lives and how the city urban infrastructure is going to be manifest, which I don't think you had to do. And I think you could have just not made those single family, made it low rise and maybe some mid rise. And maybe, as David says, even maybe resituate some of the some of the population of the urbanism does mm -hmm. happen on the park. So I do think you have more variety already embedded, and your understanding of how green space could be used by lots of people. Okay. Yeah, fair Which, enough. Fair enough. Fair. Why well, should we talk a little bit more, maybe, about the landscape that you wish to be there? The way you've described it. I was missing a little bit the productivity that this landscape could have. Um, you were talking about uh, strip green and parkscapes and so on, which is all very nice, but in a way more decorative. And I wonder if we have probably arrived at a time where we need that landscape to play, uh, play a much more important role in our cities and development and so on. And I think that's exactly the strength of the combinatory again, you know, to, to just really combine these things and to not see 
either green or high rise or single family houses or something like that, but to really see these things together so that they are actually developing into new typologies of buildings and also the infrastructure, obviously. So I don't see the highway, the freeway as such a big problem if we can actually really integrate it into the landscape and think of it as something that is probably even under a park or yeah. um, highlight, you know, things like that, you know? So I'm, I'm just, uh, Faye, I know you're, the inspiration from Wilshire Boulevard and so on, that's all totally understandable, but I would like, you know, if you were to develop this project further, I know it's at the end now, but if you were to develop it further and that must also be a conversation, mm -hmm. I would hope for it to become um, really something that makes sense in the next decade. And that really applies exactly these typologies um, that make sense, yeah, not the typologies that we have, but what can we do with the typologies that we have and make them make sense? I mean, to make... add to that, of course, this is not a boulevard, it's a freeway. And <laughs> oh. there, there's an interesting history um, in a political, in, in, in the context of a political discussion, what actually zones Los Angeles? What determines the, the, the sociology of various pieces, whatever it, your particular political affinities? And for instance, streets like Ventura Boulevard and North and Ventura Boulevard and South or Wilshire Boulevard, the, the world south of Wilshire Boulevard, which is used as a model here, I think, as I said, which is not a precise model. South of Wilshire is a very different area and gets more different the further south you go. And north of Wilshire, again, something else. Ditto the 10 freeway or the 110 freeway. You're north of the 10, you're in one zone. And none of these, none of these were determined in a conceptual way in terms of the social or political or environmental content of the area. What determined that use apparently has to do with the, with the freeway system as a kind of one dimensional piece of, of utility, like a train system or a power system or a water system. The first scheme that we looked at which tried to deal, if I understood it, which tried to deal with infrastructure, not so much as a utility, but more as a human use. So the argument for infrastructure is not that it's about moving cars or water or people or trains. It's about what is piled on top of that or in between it or underneath it. And it seems to me the problem with this is it just reiterates and by the way, at a scale, which, I mean, the, the analogies to Tokyo and Beijing and so on, I don't think that's quite the, the scale that we're dealing with. So the association of those conceptual models may not work any better than the Wilshire or the freeway model, but you're zoning the property by using a freeway. And then if that's the model, and it certainly exists in LA, then we have to say, okay, what's east of the freeway? What's west of the freeway? What's under the freeway? How does that work so that it doesn't segregate the communities? Because that's, its, that's been its effect in LA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is, uh, I've been, I was out and I'm, I've come back here now. And I, I um, this scheme is, uh, the, I, I have some issues with the scheme only because I think that the scale of this this entire area that you're looking at offers you some opportunities that you may not have in other parts of Los Angeles to deal with certain issues that have to do with uh, some very broad issues having to do with water uh, on one level, uh, infill uh, urbanization and on one level, uh, changing lifestyles uh, in the region at another level. And um, I think that, I think it was appropriate to use uh, Los Angeles analogies um, and also 
other foreign uh, analogies, but but you really have to understand the appropriateness of those analo uh, analogous uh, areas. The, for example, the there are issues having to do with the just position of tall buildings in the, next to single family houses. And, um, and I think Park La Brea is a good example, uh, but the towers aren't nearly as large as these towers. And so there's the just position is, is, is their 12 story towers, the, the, the garden apartments are, uh, there are two stories uh, uh, that people uh, with families generally prefer the uh, the garden apartments, uh, but uh, it, you know it does, it, there are uh, families that live in the the, the high rise. But uh, but generally speaking, single people live in the high rises. So lifestyle uh, it does enter into this. And so uh, the I'm not sure that Lotte Fonts is a really good example. Um, uh, it displaced over 3,500 housing units, and this is. This is a different thing. You're actually bringing new development to a site and it's controlled by a few very, uh, I would say probably a, a very few uh, sort of very large scale interests as opposed to uh, hundreds of or thousands of small individual property owners. So I think that uh, being able to do something at a grand scale here is really important. So I'm not sure this is still incremental development uh, where you've got all these individual buildings that are vertical extrusions. And uh, I don't think you're taking uh, uh, full advantage of the opportunities here. The other thing is that the parks, uh, as mentioned the open space, the parks become really important, but I don't see a lot of, uh, of dealing with the parks and the parks are really the problems because they're big holes in the ground, right? And so how do you deal with that? And uh, how does it relate to urban development? Uh, the freeway, uh, until we get electric cars, every, everyone's driving electric cars, are still an enormous polluting uh, environment. So using it as an organizational uh, thing is it, 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 at, at, at some level, it's not very appropriate. Uh, the other thing is the river, uh, the channelization of the river. Uh, this is an area where environmentally you could actually address some very important issues having to do with water resources and, and flooding. And the characteristic of the river is it's flooded, but then the Santa Fe Dam controls that. So you have an opportunity actually doing something a little different here. And when Frank did his LA River work, he, he, had, he came to the, the rude realization that he had to solve the hydrology issues before he could actually uh, address the issues of development. So that I don't see here. So I think that needs to be uh, somehow addressed. And, uh, but um, I, I find it a little bit chaotic in the way Los Angeles is. And I'm, it may be chaotic, uh, being chaotic is a, a, a virtuous thing and it certainly is. But I think there are some very big issues that could be dealt with in this site and it's not being addressed. So I don't see it, so. Um, thank you. Um, maybe I need to clarify a little bit about the parks, just because it has, um, you know, varieties of depths and it has a difficult situation. That's why I particularly leave these, no, these eight nodes and as um, functioned as parks to leave the potential and the possibility to, um, for you know, um, flooding or urban, um, wired um, features to grow. Um, so I think, and also pushing back, pushing back the cities in between these parks, it well allows the interaction be, uh, from parks, city, parks, parks to city to park, parks to city to park. So I, I think that's, um, uh, that's why I'm, um, I think it, it's more um, attract to me. Um, and also about the, um, the high rise and single family thing. I'm not like, even though I, I said before, I'm kind of favor for single family house for living. However, um, I said in this um, 
particularly. I think I have, um, based on the things I have, this grid uh, system, based on this um, vertical and the horizontal grids, um, it, it has, um, it simply can be divide, divided, the site can simply divide it into mm -hmm. different parts um, to uh, have this, you know, module, module like uh, area. And each module can, it has, you can freely um, arrange the high rise single families. It's not, uh, maybe it's not particularly or necessarily to just locate the high rise in the middle, but you can play with it within this module. So it, ha it will have more um, flexibilities. And one point I would make in response to that is that the models, again, the models you're using, the property definitions that, are, that determine the sizes in Los Angeles of residences, how big, how high, how wide, how much setback, and the towers too. So the subdivision of property in Century City, which was mentioned previously, or downtown, has to do with, the, again, the subdivision of property and what those subdivisions mean in terms of limiting heights and setbacks and parking requirements and all of that, all of that stuff. When you're working in an area that has no such property subdivisions, right. the, the scale of the buildings, of the houses, of the towers, raises this, and it is a, certainly not a new subject, and it looks to me like there's a kind of, there's, there's a type which we see and know and recognize whether we love it or not, um, of houses, single family houses of a certain scale, towers of a certain size, if point towers and so on, as opposed to examining what, what opportunities exist when the property is open and the division of land isn't predetermined. And that, that makes a very substantial difference in terms of the kinds of buildings that are likely to be proposed. You're not limited by what, what limits building in Los Angeles. You're setting mm -hmm. your own limits. Mm -hmm. Correct. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Basically, I'm just, um, since it's located in LA, so I'm uh, looking more inspirations and res respecting more from the um, existing uh, condition, existing fabric. But you're right, I'm not uh, kind of, I'm a, um, set me up uh, myself a free raise in the LA. Um, I mean, the hydrology the, could set that. What's a property model that goes with this hydrological landscape? And I, and I, the more I look at your scheme, Faye, I realize you've got like, if you did, some of what's suggested, if this were to flood violently at moments, you basically have like five horseshoe falls here, you know, horseshoe falls like Niagara Falls. Like you could, you could essentially reorganize the property around the horseshoes and think about the temporal flooding and these flooded landscapes as a massive asset, both pictorially like, like, um, uh, like Niagara Falls and as a, as a, you know, as a water resource. But I think then the, the cliffs and the escarpment might, you know, the way like rivers used to in cities like Cincinnati or Manhattan or elsewhere would start to push back on the property model and maybe set a different uh, template for it. But I, I think that, that some of those suggestions could be quite interesting. Like if you really... I mean, you know, these cliffs are not small, they're 200 feet. So even if it floods like, you know, how often would this flood twice a year that you might get, and the waterfalls probably aren't roaring, they're probably trickles, but even that would still be pretty incredible when it mm -hmm. happens and something that could be, um, you know, in the dry seasons and the wet seasons, really something interesting to experience. I forget the name of the junction in the northern the, the, LA the River. In Shanghai? Oh, no, no, no. There's a junction in the northern part of the LA River where three tributaries come together that has some pretty incredible hydrological effects. It's, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll look it up while we're talking. Mm -hmm. But, you are know, you that kind are, are you speaking of the area near the 405 and the uh, uh, 
the uh, 101 freeway or the one yeah it, it definitely has bridges and That's other Sepul sepulveda basin i think or is... sepulveda basin yeah yeah I yeah right. i think that is it yeah but yeah. that you know that kind of compression of hydrology that happens there is really really fantastic if you could figure out a way for that to become you know inhabitable and a characteristic to sell and i think some of that's kind of going on in the scheme just a outside observation Faye, that could be useful to think about okay thanks sounds but, good i was gonna add one more little okay yeah go ahead well it, there's a book by michael anderson called urban magic which you might want to just take a look at he's a really interesting person here in los angeles mm -hmm. uh working to try to I don't know, gives, gives strength, power, and opportunity to uh, Black communities. And one of his, his arguments is pro-single family, um, particularly if you understand it with having an ADU, JADU apartments built into it. And part of his interest or understanding is that if you think of these as small multifamily units, uh, it provides rental property for the landowner and the landowner can actually then pay their mortgage. And you know, there's opportunities to advance uh, equity and establish oneself. Um, and that can happen at the single family home scale, but can't happen at the tower scale in the same way in terms of also architects trying to, or designers or other people building equity and changing and evolving their landscapes. A lot of what you design or what looks here is these massive urban plannings doesn't always provide, let's say, for the ad hoc nature of people taking opportunities. Um, if it's all homeowners communities, if it's all pre-built towers, there's something that's gonna get missing. So I'm just throwing that back at you as sort of my own devil's advocate to saying there might be value in the single family home that you could play with or think about, but maybe um, in a different way. Thank you. Can you I'm can you type suggesting. the name of the? Uh, the yeah, I, I, I will. Again? I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what, you're saying that this the potential here is is to create equity for disadvantaged uh, families, and it, it, it this may be a, a very interesting model. I would think I, you know, it's it's interesting the the country of Botswana. Um, in the late 50s began a process of giving land, uh, in some cases urban, which was very small, in uh, rural areas, I think it was probably uh, two or three hectares, to, um, to a person when they uh, turned 18. So they could actually uh, begin to have a, a piece of, uh, uh, of something they could appreciate. Uh, over time and um, have some equity. And I think that's a really interesting idea, especially in a city like ours where our neighborhoods are so segregated and um, there may be an opportunity to hear uh, in this case, but you're talking a much less dense scheme, but you're addressing a kind of social equity issue, which I think is would be a really interesting idea. So, um, but it's still, it's still the issue of the environmental. It still needs to be addressed. The issue of water and how it's uh, hydrology and how it's being uh, looked at, and uh, some assumptions relative to that. And uh, uh, there's some really interesting opportunities in this particular uh, area. And um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's let's finish with Brian. Okay, thank you. Thank you. thank you all. Thank you all for comment. Thank you, Faith. Hi, um, hi guys. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm a nice one. Hold up. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yeah, we can see it right now. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, my project. Uh, uh, subtly different uh, compared to the other three people. And also, thank you for like my cl cl classmates. They mentioned a, a lot of the information of the, the Los Angeles and also the Avondale. And this is the other idea I was, I tried to uh, focus on like the, uh, a lot of the uh, 
there are a lot of uh, magnificent cities that located along with the river. So while well, 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 I was thinking about that, the, the, the second one, the, the watershed of the San Gabriel River. So what is the, the future of the Avondale? And uh, this is the original, uh, you can see the dot line is the original pit of the ship. And I was thinking that uh, I, I tried to like remain all of the pits like not do not uh, ship the, the form too much. And so I was compared to like the size of the each different city that like the Silver Lakes, uh, Central Park Lakes. You can see that I, I, uh, if I, I remain all of that, I can get the 19 pits of that. And the other issue of that, I want to mention that the green coverage, you can see that the disparities of Los Angeles, you can see that the, the only like along with the hills, is, is you can narrow down to that. If you go into that the Irondale, you can see that the, the coverage is quite low like the, along with the Irondale. So I, I was thinking that if I, I call that the Irondale is kind of the, the model of the Los Angeles because they, they serve a lot of the concrete to build the highway, the highway city. So I was thinking that uh, what is the next? Because uh, there is a, a limitation of the of digging the, the, the soil and so and the, the earth. So I'm thinking that maybe that, that, that is the other opportunity that I, I, I want to like uh, maximize the green space. So that is my first idea to, to, to do that, my scheme. So how to bridge the, the two sides of the communities. And the other, the other big issue is that you can see that the green space, uh, Los Angeles is not, is not quite high and colored in the middle, but you can see that the, the, the inequality, I mean, you can, if you map in this one to the income map, you can see that the, the, the first uh, like really dense of the, the green space is mostly is for <laughs> high income space. So, and also you can see here that the Malibu is really, really high because I know it's, it's on the hill of that. And the other, you can see that it's not really uh, the quality of that, the, the green space. So that that is the, I try to uh, use the green space. Uh, you can see that uh, I uh, make, uh, recalculate the, the each the neighbor, if I provide those like seventy percent green to the neighbor, so I can like boost the the the, uh, the percentage of the green space for the each community. So the other uh, the other one is that I I, I I won't say that is the 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 new core to replace the Los Angeles downtown. I will say it's kind of the kind of the parallels. If you see that the 45 minutes by Metro, you can go to the Kensington, to the West, to the East to, of the London, and New York is the uptown and downtown, and the Paris, of course, the, the, uh, the France and to the, the, Palm, Palm, the Central. So it's kind of the, the, the same idea of the 45 minutes by Metro. And you can see that the, I, I was thinking that the, a lot of uh, majority of the highway or the road is horizontal, not a vertical. So I was thinking that how to bridge the north and south. And so this is like the, uh, how I, uh, this my, the, the main part of that, I try to uh, manipulate the line system like into along with the highway. So, and also like concentrate only in the middle so the, 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 the next one is this one, is that the density. So I was compared like, because I, I only, I try to like maximize the green space. So I only have a, a really small space to build of that. So I have to use the density to, to uh, thinking about how high of the tower and how, how, how quantity of the, the buildings. So our target is that the, uh, 
uh, this cut the, the people. And I try to like, oh, the density is quite high. Like, I mean, you can compare it to that. The other, like Manhattan, Brooklyn, it does that. If I only build the 9% of the all of the site, it gotta be like over a little bit the Manhattan, but lower than the other, like uh, the capital of the Philippines or something, the Hong Kong. And uh, the other one, the last one is that the, the new edge, I was thinking that a lot of the uh, public uh, function of the, is along with that, the, the edge, not, not, not in the central. So I was thinking that uh, I found that a lot of the school and museum libraries, community center, uh, it's along with that, the, just kind of the fragment. So I was thinking that if I, because I only have 2% to build on the edge. So it's quite like uh, the 19% in the, in, the, in the middle, 9% uh, in the middle and 2% in the edge, on the edge. So it's like a small consumption, like 88% nature and 12% of the building. So you can see that the system, uh, how I uh, built the, the whole. So that, that is the whole uh, diagram of that. So uh, this is the one perspective that you can see that the really high density in, in, along with that. And also you can see the yellow, yellow uh, line is the natural line is connected to the, the two station of the golden light and the, to the south. And this is the opposite, uh, the other side of the junction. You can see that the density, the really high density of the tower. So I compare it to the Manhattan. You can see that here, uh, this is the central part and the density of is that. So I try to like build the same of the height, the, the, the amount of the height and also compare that the, the, in different way. And this is the other view of the tower and how what, some of the tower uh, are tra transformed to like the horizontal, not all of the vertical, try to like extend, stretch to the, the, the dam. And you can see that here, I compare the, 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 the famous uh, common, like the long of the, 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 the orange little part, uh, orange one is that the, uh, apartment and uh, the vertical one is the towers office. So this is the, the other view of that. And I also like compare like the the Los Angeles, the Silver Lake. So we 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 uh, I I remain all of the uh, the peaks. So it's gonna be like the what one well eleven times. So this is the the other the whole of the view like from to the Oh, sorry, to the, to, from the community side. And the other one is that the, the south of the, the station, it's like the small, a little bit smaller than the King Cross. And so, well, this is the south because that I, I was mentioned that the, the, the issue of the, the in between, there's a, two stations in between. So I have to build the new station to bridge that too. And the other part is that the, how to uh, uh, connect the neighbor from the west and east. So it's kind of that 25 times as the bigger as the part. So this is the other part, uh, this other side of the perspective. So I changed the color light because my skin is it's like, uh, along with the highway. So I try to like change the color so you can see the clear. And so that that's one is the my set thing. Yeah, that is all I have. Thank you. How many people, what population is this city designed for? Your version? Uh, uh, a million or? Yeah. No. It's like the size of San Francisco. 
What was the reference to 100,000? Was it uh, density? 100,000 people. For what? Uh, there, there's a target here. The, like the studio I, idea of Los Angeles yeah. expanding its population and with Irwindale being able to accommodate the 100,000 people as like a potentiality for new growth within the Los Angeles metropolitan is where right. the 100,000 number comes from across all of the studio participants. Yeah. These, these and however, in this case, you chose to go 10 times bigger. I'd say maybe more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this density I calculate by the if I uh, build the whole site of the Irwindale, I, I only have this density. So that is the in the beginning, like how to you know to have a a, a big concept of the density. And uh, but eleven, 11 thousand people per square mile is not very dense. So there may be a contradiction here, but assume that you're trying to attract more and you've, you've got greater density. So it's maybe uh, 10 to 20 times that or something like that. I, it's hard to say, but uh, okay. And then um, back to your scheme. Yeah. So I mean, Yeah, I think the, uh, if, I mean, I, you know, I think the issue of scale becomes rather, it's one of the big, big things I think that all schemes have had to deal with. And um, if you look at the Santa Fe Dam, and if I don't know how many people, have, how many of us have been up on the dam, but it, it really is, it itself is an abstraction. So I, I, uh, and it's enormous, it's unbelievable. And if you go up on a bike, for instance, you, and you see a head, you can see a person on it. It's, it's, the scale of it's just immense. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, a, it's an expression of what this whole thing's about. And the fact you're engaging the, the, a portion of the dam, I find, I find, I don't find it a problem. I, I think in fact, it's, it makes it kind of interesting and you're relating it to a, a major regional park so that's an amenity those those uh, these strands could uh, experience you know and i think that that's that's okay um i still i sort of uh question the wisdom of really straddling and and trying to to make something out of the freeway i think in some ways that if you're dealing with 10 times the density then you know, well over a million people, um, you probably need to have some kind of transit to, uh, um, <clears throat> or you end up spreading it out. And But I, I think one of the advantages here is having the big open spaces and, and making something of it. But, you know, I don't know how you fill up those pits. They're 200 feet deep and that, that's, uh, it's gonna take a lot of water to do that. And, um, we're now learning that water is quite precious. And so I'm not sure if we can spare that much unless it's being uh, stored. Uh, then you have the Silver Lake problem where they're gonna build a, they wanted to build a build a uh, enclosure over it just to protect the potable water. And uh, they've developed this thing along the LA River now that is gonna provide uh, that uh, function. So, um, so I think that the again that these these areas that filling up with water is a big it's very difficult I would think but it's um, certainly is appealing for sure I mean then why don't you connect them with channels so you can uh, I guess there's elevation change and you have problems there so you can't do that <clears throat> but. Um, I want to ask you something, Brian. How do you expect people will move through this area? So if you are living on one end yeah. um, and you have friends on the other end, are you going to go on the freeway? Are you 
um, you can drive, are you walking, are you riding a fabulous fast bike, as we've seen them there on the site visit. Um, how is that, you know, just in terms of scale, yeah, which we are actually really seeing in the image that we're seeing here. Um, and, you know, what, what life do we imagine in this here? Is it different from the rest of Los Angeles or will it be a Los Angeles this um, edition? Uh -huh. Yeah, that is a good question. That I, 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 I in, in the previous idea, I, I don't want to like, oh, okay, that, that is a like, uh, abstraction, like, okay, people that yeah, you have to move that because there are a lot of benefits. But I was thinking the other opposite way, like how to like have a big uh, benefit to the community. After that, I can take the only temp or uh, only left the part to, to maximize or to optimize the, the something, the new, because I would say the urban there is really, really huge. So you can build anywhere and you can do any kind of the scheme. But for me, like if you mention that the Los Angeles, the first image in my mind is that highway. And people use, usually use the highway to experience the city. And so I was thinking that if I, the, the, the downtown of the, a lot of different uh, uh, urban object, like along with the highway, it's kind of a new urban section when you uh, drive your car, pet, uh, even though you, you don't have to stop there and experience the city. That. Yeah, okay. Um, but isn't there maybe yet yeah, something else that we could be working into the scheme that would be a bit less freeway, um, in individual car, and, and so on, um, that we could be thinking about. I mean, I'm just trying to um, understand how that scheme is really going to work. I'm giving you an example. Now here in Los Angeles, during COVID times, um, everybody wanted to get out and walk. But then I heard, I continuously heard um, the complaint that people were also saying, well, it's actually boring to walk in Los Angeles because there's not very much you can see while you're walking along the streets and it's actually all very far away. So you can't just simply get out of your car and go for a walk as you would probably do in many other cities. It's um, also very hot. So I want to, it's also very hot. Exactly. That's the other part. And here in Irvingdale, it is brutally hot, totally unshaded. So I would kind of like to understand a little bit what life you sort of emerge, uh, imagine here. Yeah. So the one thing is the life on the ground, which is parks and all these kind of things. But then how do we move through this? Yeah. I mean, it's like, what's that film that you are seeing? What's that? Um, those, what are those sequences? Yeah. So this is where the plan here that we're seeing has its limits. And I'm, I'm, I'd be hoping um, you could give me a reference to a movie you have seen or something like that where you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a whatever um, night scheme of a Wong Kar Wai Shanking Express or uh, something like that. Yeah. Um, and um, what is it? Yeah. So that we can also imagine the scale a little bit better because otherwise it is really um, you know, what I'm seeing here, what I find always so utterly frustrating in reviews, especially in Los Angeles, is that it always comes down to parking because every apartment needs to have two parking lots and, and things like that, you know, and, and or if not more. And, um, and so all of a sudden, the only concern that is out there is the parking. And, and isn't this something that should be at least discussed or soon over? I, you know, so, but then that means that you also, while you're designing something, developing something like this, have other images at hand of how this could be working. Yeah, so are there um, other ways of transportation? Um, yeah, mixed, mixed transportation. Yeah, so you can take your bike, get it on a train, um, do some walking and, you know, um, shared bikes, shared uh, cars, clean cars. Um, people movers and so on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say that um, 
Brian, that can you guys hear me? I think my headphones are about to die. You're good, David. We can hear you. Okay. Um, you know, Park Labre has come up a couple times. It's a, you know, and has has been brought up as something that's not this scale. And I, I wonder, you know, if there's a way, Brian, that there's a kind of, you know, beautiful messiness, I would say, to your combinatorial urbanism that's not resolved. And I think that there's a way that you could, a couple ways you could embrace that. But um, part of it, part of it could be to argue systematically for a couple things that have been coming up. I mean, one is that instead of introducing 100,000 people to the site, you know, could this absorb 100,000 existing tenants from the adjacencies um, and evacuate other parts of the site that are underutilized or other areas that are abandoned? You know, I wonder if this could become a magnet that could begin to restructure the zone, if you will. It's not necessarily relying on a wholly new population. Of course, it may be relying on that, but but could also be really working from its adjacencies and looking to absorb resources from the perimeter. Um, and I, you know, I wonder if similar to that the freeway does go through it, but it also understands that the, free the freeway is probably going to become obsolete at some point in the next 50 years. It has another system of transit in it, and it's thinking about how that freeway becomes another kind of artery or river that's disconnected from other areas. I mean, I think those th that kind of phasing, every proposal we've seen so far seems to be assuming that you have to have 100,000 new people. Mm -hmm. And also that there's, you know, it's been brought up about the channelizing or the freeway that existing systems are going to persist, presumably for the next 50 to 100 years. And I just, the imagery that you're suggesting that this can kind of absorb all the messiness that's there, but maybe to release the perimeter, I think is an interesting proposition. How much of that messiness could it absorb how much of that obsolescence could it absorb and turn that into a, a vehicle for reorigination or for recapitulation, including the dam, you know, as was brought up, that's a pretty spectacular structure and maybe it becomes obsolete if I'm flooding big areas here, but you know, the kind of absorptive heterotopic um, signifiers that I'm seeing in your plan I think should come associated with it, a kind of political and geographic work that maybe presents a different model than the typical uh, economic and financial development models that we're accustomed to. That this certainly, I would argue, does not look very consumable by those, those financiers. It certainly, it looks a lot messier, a lot more fragmented and a lot more dirty. And I think I would embrace that. I would kind of go with that and suggest as a result, maybe it's a, it's, you know, again, it's a kind of big alteration. It's absorbing things that are already almost obsolete. It can think about future obsolescence. It's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a metabolizing the waste of LA, if you will, and turning that into an asset. I think that to me could be a really big, sell, that it's ad hoc, it builds off of leverages things that are going to become obsolete, floods and takes up space where it's buying space by absorbing those things. You know, I think I see some of that in the language. And I just wonder if that's a direction that could present maybe a different narrative than we've seen in the other three that's specific to your scheme. Um, I'm reading a lot of this in the plan, but also the density you know, and I think it answers questions. It, it raises a lot of questions. Displacement is usually not a good thing, but it sounds like, and I'm not intimately familiar with Irwindale, that it's not a great destination to begin with. And that maybe there's a lot of people who would prefer not to live there who currently live there and in its adjacencies. And so if you find a way, you know, Stephen, you were kind of touching upon this in terms of the racial politics and inequities of LA. I'm wondering if there's a way to leverage that just kind of in a like hyper local way and say, could it kind of cannibalize things and absorb them and become a, 
a prototype for doing that in different areas um, that could densify underutilized regions of Los Angeles. Um, Cause it seems like that's, you know, I mean, I, I'm somewhat familiar with it. I've been there, but you know, the jury keeps saying like, this is kind of like, it's totally underutilized. Who the hell would want to go here? So um, starting with the adjacent community could be an interesting place to start. And it's been brought up leveraging existing assets. I think all four of you are doing really well, but I think Brian, you could bring up obsolescence and kind of the ad hoc combinatorial nature of consuming the waste of the city and how that repurposes it in really compelling ways and beautiful ways. Cause I love the, you know, I love the texture, you know, to Karen's point, like I want to walk through this kind of, I'm a little scared by it, but I also could imagine it to be a very interesting landscape. Um, but I want you to kind of sell it more and give me more clarity on what it's doing, what its bigger project is. Cause I, I don't think it's the Weiss Manfredi project, which is a kind of cover up and clean up project. I think this could really, um, you know, embrace, embrace the, the kind of beautiful loser, ugly qualities of LA that most people don't like to talk about and suggest that that's an asset. Thank you. David's comments are, are great. Shifting, shifting what we talked about before in the past to suggest this is actually quite interesting, right? To change my color. But that this is a provocation versus this, which is maybe what we've seen more before. And part of me was going, oh, well, this is what actually works and seems that's actually 50,000 people. But maybe this is much more provocative, challenging, try to make this something as opposed to, you know, another echo park. So I, I do think there's, a, there's some power in what David has posed for you and you're working on. It seems just there's an editing issue, but I don't really understand that. Maybe it's because we have this and we have that. And this seems so happy. And this seems so intense. I think there may also have been an, an assumption in urbanism of the past, I don't know, maybe 50 years that unless you had some degree of densification, there just wouldn't be enough economic uh, change to justify uh, larger scale infrastructural, you know, maneuvers, you know. And I don't think that's necessarily true, you know, for the next 50 years. Uh, we've got a lot of other kinds of emergencies as opposed to the emergency of, uh, you know, uh, post-war urbanization and, Cold War military strategy is spreading people out, and a lot of that's kind of over, you know. And we're facing environmental emergencies and equity issues, uh, and the government is becoming more and more uh, politically uh, enabled to uh, engage in gigantic, colossal expenditures of public money. So there may be something other than bringing shitloads of people here you know, as a way to make this kind of project viable, you know? So like you have a lot of towers here. I'm just looking at the, your kind of abstractions in search of reality, you know, and I don't know how necessary the high density towers are in this project. Like uh, the critical piece of form seems to be more these attenuated lines, volumetric lines, like hair just kind of placed in various, locations that like brush strokes and uh, it might be about something else, you know, it might be more infrastructural mitigating moves and maybe a smaller degree of occupation. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's interesting if this was, um, if we were in China and this was Shenzhen, we've, oh. we've found a dilapidated site and uh, in, in the case of Shenzhen, what, 30, 35 years from 5,000 people to 25 million plus, et cetera. The, the, the macro, the, the enormous conversation here would be a decision of allowing L, the LA metropolitan region of 17 and a half million people plus minus to continue its uh, monolithic growth 
and whether it can sustain that type of growth infrastructurally, infrastructure, both transportation, services, et cetera, et cetera, versus the importance of building a new intensification and locating that in this, and, and determining hmm, if this is one of many sites. Bill, when you showed me the site, I forgot yeah. there were four or five of these sites in Los Angeles of looking at this, and this would be a study for the opportunity for using this um, site, which at this point has no value, which is seen as a negative in the city, right? And making this one of the areas for intensification and making an argument at the scale of the metropolis in the terms that have been discussed here in bits and pieces of whether this represents a reasonable strategy. And then after that, the specifics of the intent, the density, et cetera, are part of a study. That we could look at this and whether it's 100,000 or 500,000 would be part of the study and we'd be able to discuss the consequences of that in physical terms. The relation of what the city would look like if this takes place and whether it makes sense is a, in a broader argument. Um, Bill, we've talked about, can you go from seven to 15 lanes on a freeway? When does it break? The system we have right now, right? Well, you, yeah, I think that- Where, uh, where this equal kind of this, this, this monolithic of, of fabric over, over um, just under a hundred miles from edge to edge <clears throat> and whether it requires these types of intensification, which LA defines as an urban environment, as a multi-centered city. And we're just saying this is going to be an addition to one of those multiple nodes. And the transportation will start focusing now from node to node and would, would understand Los Angeles equal to Holland. So as we're connecting cities, we're treating it exactly like countries treat it. And, and we're equal to the size of Holland. It would be the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is old track. I and downtown is, 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 is Amsterdam and on and on, right? And, and we start a, a much broader kind of thinking of the nature of, let's say, just thinking 50 years out or something. But it'd be something much more common in certain places in the world. And today, of course, this is every day. This is, we're getting paid for this when we work in China or we work even in the Middle East. Well, Bill, as you know, in the Middle East, this could be seen as a, um, a scheme that maximizes open space. And it produces extremely efficient um, movement, transportation systems, et cetera, based on projects that we're now working on. Yeah? Yeah. I think, right. Tom, it seems to me that, that if it's a, a part of a, an overall regional strategy, because strategy is the operative term here, whether it's transferring equity to the disadvantaged or it's a um, it's an opportunity to intensify and, and produce a different type of lifestyle uh, that LA is not necessarily accustomed to, but is certainly heading to with the re renovation of the downtown and the interest in, in living, living in, in sort of industrial areas. Um, but it seems to me that you need to start with a transportation uh, 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 assumption uh, that that connects you to the, the region somehow without the dependence of the car. And um, I, it, it reminds me, I mean, it's, this is a, if you're talking about analogies that, the, uh, that uh, it required an enormous amount of commercial investment and, and government investment was the Canary Wharf pro project where uh, uh, the city, uh, of London was really, uh, really didn't have a new kind of new place for uh, the younger people to go and that sort of thing and, and uh, or businesses to, uh, to settle in. And of course they didn't have transportation the first 10 years and it just about killed the project. Um, so in a way you need to, to establish a, a publicly minded transportation linkage somehow to these, these sites that you're talking about in the urban region, you know, and transportation planners tend to try to, to locate the, the transportation system to existing areas, uh, you know, Wilshire Boulevard, for example, you know, the tunneling underneath it. They very seldom think about the opportunities of, of some of these inner areas that have been traditionally the back 
area that people really think of as, oh, we won't want to live there or whatever. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea here with the river, as it is in LA, the LA River, is redirecting the attention to the river, the industrial area of the river, and making it something a part of the urban fabric and an exciting new, new thing. And it seems to me that this is another one of those examples of being able to really create, uh, you know, a place where it's, it's, it's different and it offers diversity of lifestyle and, and some really interesting things. So I think your, your idea, uh, uh, Tom, of trying to make something out of this is, is, is right on. It's just that, uh, you, you know, it's, it's a very difficult approach, this whole thing, because of its scale and magnitude. And uh, it's dependent upon both public and private investment. Um, but, we're but gonna, Bill, we're Bill we're, like we now are, are hmm, this, is, this isn't future, this is present. We're running our office on these jobs. <laughs> these, yeah. these, these are taking oh, place at the moment. I right? know, and, but it's predicated. Um, it's, predicated. It's, our, it's the problem of the US of A, it, actually. It's not the problem in China or in the middle, in the middle where we're working, right? Um, I well, look at this me, very me, conservative. But this I think that this, radical. I think David. Well, add that, Bill. That one generation. I grew up in Whittier, and it, there were there were um, orange groves and avocado groves. We're looking at a city that's all um, literally we're we're still building on the rancheros. We're, we're second generation, and so this is nothing new at all to Los Angeles. It's a city of it's barely a century old. Right. So in that sense, it's 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 absolutely just common sense. I mean, it's it's not at all even visionary, really. It's actually just totally makes sense of how you'd use. Mm, you mentioned, I think, the fact that this is a single territory. Forget the city. It's a site. Yeah, this and is a this fairly is, large well, site. It that has very specific attributes that that has been explained by the various teams. Right. <clears throat> and now it's whether those attributes are valid to generate some sort of a density or some sort of a, a particular set of uses that make sense for the greater metropolitan area. I think the, Tom, one of the, it's interesting you bring up Monrovia because, and, and the, you could say other neighborhoods as well. Uh, these were large land holdings, particularly uh, determined by agriculture at one point, but then uh, the economic unit is really the, the individual property owner buying a piece of equity. <laughs> and, and the whole Los Angeles has been predicated upon hyper-individualism. And uh, I have my car, I have my house, I have my backyard and that sort of thing. And uh, it's now beginning to experience something different. We don't have a system where we have a king who can invest or a communist party ruler who can invest huge amounts of resources in doing uh, major uh, 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 structures. I mean, it's it's a bit of a problem. I mean, I would think that that uh, that in the in a city that's the most uh, uh, individualistic, perhaps in the, in the United States. Uh, which is one of the nice things about it, you know. It's you know you can you can uh, you can uh, you can explore all types of creative avenues here, and uh, uh, but to depend on being able to build a transit system, it's taking us fifty years to get where we are today. And uh, now I'm, let's don't get uh, deterred by this, uh, but. Uh, it does represent a problem in uh, this particular. Uh, Bill, all we can do is present. Um, yeah. We can make arguments for more reasonable options. I can't change the world. I don't even care right. about that at some level. I mean, we're right. trying to develop ideas that have some, hmm, at some level, articulate problems that describe the problematic in the system you're talking about. Right. And that are will not be operational. And um, you, um, the notion of what an automobile is radically changed by one person, by Mr. Musk. Right. 
and then Biden just announced that there's going to be what 50 percent of vehicles will be electric in, in what 30 nine years from now. That was done by one person, really, right? He transformed what we call transportation. That's very kind of essential in this country, especially. Um, we're we're just attempting to show alternatives to say this is the these are the consequences of our urban strategies. And it will, these are just, hmm, these are all just provocations. They're not, they're right. not meant to be in any way, quote, real. And no, so they're meant to happen. open up, they're, they're meant to ask questions. I wish Eric was here because they're not meant to be solutions. He had that one all wrong. Right. They're meant to open up questions and to ask questions. And it's starting with the, the, the formal strategy. They're not meant to be literal at all. They're meant to be, the, you have to start with a provocation that begins the process of asking complex, intricate pro problems that have to do with urban design, right? And so they're, they're balanced between some, mm, some sense of reality in terms of the complexity of urban space and their, their necessity as a provoker, as a, as, a, as a starter to kind of describing the projects, right? And that they're, they're in some kind of, they're in between at that level. They, they, yeah, they speak I, at both, both levels. But, you know, I think you used an operative term at the outset, which was, uh, you know, what is the strategy? What is the strategy of this, of this piece of property? And, you know, it's probably, it, it being on the river, it's, it, has to something, it has something to do with water resources. So I think that that as a strategy, as, as a water machine would be really very interesting if you were to, to imagine imagine that as a so kind of an origin for an idea here um, and then begin to think about urban development uh, developing around this kind of machine that would be kind of interesting i would think and uh, yeah well there's some other some things I'm, that didn't come up yeah the first projects kind of did that the first yeah. projects posed some ideas uh, surrounding yeah. actually total different infrastructural ways of thinking about the water or the pit or what it could be done. Right. Um, but I do think on many levels, Tom's agenda is being achieved. Yeah. These are provocations. They are managing landscape, yeah. water work. They're very difficult because they are large scaled. The idea of them serving 100,000 people is probably not, a, not right on. Maybe they should have been serving uh, 500,000 to a million because they most of the students went ahead and did that anyway. Um, yeah. If I was going to add something to this conversation, I would just say also, as much as we're managing an ecological provocation and purpose, there may also be a socio-political one or a cultural one as well. And those also can be part of your agenda for how you design the formal urbanism how these forms land themselves on the fields, how they develop themselves, how they partition, how they create spaces and environments, work in relationship to the ecology, whether they're tall, whether they're high, whether they're nodal, whether they're dispersive, those are all great ideas. And so I think you are taking them on. Um, maybe I would ask the students to maybe be a little more clear on what those might be for them. Um, I would just, I would only add, um, Tom, you know, I think your idea that this is a site and some of what Bill's been saying, I mean, to me, this resonates very strongly across these four projects. And I would say what, what, what I find interesting, but also a little bit lacking is to make those provocations, I think you need to identify the specific assets you're leveraging on the site. Um, and so in Brian's case, uh, and I do think it is Bill, partly the water, but the first scheme was much more the water. You know, yeah. this one, what yeah. I find so compelling about this is Brian is like literally like stitching together the freeway and the dam and the channelized river. You know, he's, he's treating those as existing systems that he can repurpose. So, I mean, to me, the interesting narrative here, Brian, would be that you're repurposing those because they're now obsolete or they could be leveraged in different ways because maybe because of future transit systems you know i don't there's many different answers i could use to suggest that that part of the freeway becomes obsolete 
or that you're managing water in a way that the Santa Fe Dam doesn't have to do the work that it currently does, that I could build on it and stitch it and break it and work with it as a uh, other kind of urbanism. What, what I think is interesting about that in Brian's scheme, Tom, is it's, not, it's the only one of the three that's really leveraging extremely close reads of existing assets, those three lines, the freeway, the dam, and the channelized river as something that he could really um, you know, work with. I think we may all have questions about how he's working with it. I think he's doing a reasonably good job at a first, as a first pass. And I like the fact that he's trying to pull them together. Um, so like I'm, if I'm on the dam, I'm more, I'm walking between the dam and the freeway or on the freeway and the dam now, you know, I'm imagining what? scenarios here, but I, I think that cross section, predominantly short section strategy of bridging and stitching and hybridizing those existing structures is super huh. interesting. David, I have something that he could only do here. David, David I, I was attracted to the way it engages the Santa Fe Dam, for example. Yeah. I mean, I, I, at the outset, and then you're, you're right about it. It does pull in the river. I mean, it, it reinforces the western edge of the river. Yeah, and exactly. I, yep. I find that interesting. It also backs away from the water elements, you know, and they can almost uh, do, become their own, uh, their own thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, huh. But so deal with the water issue, you know. So it's kind of interesting, yeah. David, I have the exact opposite reading that you do. I look at this, and it makes references to Corbusier and, and Congi, etc. And I'm gonna. I read something this morning. It's an anniversary of uh, Frampton's critical regionalism in 1984, and I'm, I'm. It was something that had huge influence on me. And Bill, when you showed me the site, my first instinct was the interest and the absolute uniqueness. The literal, there's only a single kind of condition that exists and this is one, This is at this particular place, right? And it had to do with the scale and, and all the various conditions that produce this site. And strange, I would have thought, hmm, both um, the first Wilson and, and for me, Lawrence's scheme, both of them dealt with the site conditions as a beginning point. And Bill, I just, um, I made an assumption that this would be the project that everybody would be interested in, and it wasn't. I looked yeah. at these, these incredibly unique, 200 foot, three, uh, three quarters of a mile across, the biggest one, insane. And in fact, it wasn't. It seemed to be, mm, we kept talking about it and it didn't have the same essence to them that it did to me in terms of the uniqueness. Yeah, I, I, but I would have I thought the first two definitely yeah. were attempting to deal with that. And I, I don't think uh, mm, um, Lawrence didn't take it far enough, but it could have been an incredibly interesting subterranean city that you actually filled this thing with, with, with city instead of water. But yeah. again, yeah. in, 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 um, in um, Wilson's game, he, he built the city around these things. They became kind of this new territory and both of those were kind of highly specific to the to the found condition, and the other ones were using space in between or something. Um, aha! So right. Faye is using them as again kind of connect. We didn't get to that. The, the, her parks, her six parks, are connected tissue to the surrounding neighborhood, and it's, it was the exact opposite scheme of Lawrence's. And um, Tom, what you're in suggesting the modern is urban that, idea. Well, yeah. the, those specific site conditions, everyone that you've mentioned is literally found in the ground and is, you know, generally the territory of, it's territorial and landscape. What I find interesting about Brian's project is that he's finding large scale structures. It seems to me he's working less with the ground than with the existing structures on the right. site. So I think it's a, a different take on site but an equally compelling and complimentary one. I'm not suggesting one's better than the other, but that that's a bit different and important maybe in this discussion. At least that's what I see in, in, in Brian's. But if you look at the first, if you look at Wilson's scheme, he's going to tell you that he can place X amount of city at these edges. And they're, they're essentially 20 stories plus minus at the edges. And we're going to discuss very early on what does that kind of mean? The number of population you get if you just built the edges. And then after that, it starts a project. And it seems to be absolutely kind of specific. I don't know, for me, Bill, 
the, the whole kind of instinct about this is a fascinating project would be the use of these things. Kind of how, and how does it operate, not architecturally, urbanistically, at that kind of scale, right? And it offered these just incredibly interesting, um, Eric was asking about the compellingness of the project. I would think if you're looking at neighborhoods or what makes Venice or name your community that has some sort of characteristic, but most of them have none. They're, they're Culver City. They're not even cities. You don't know even there, right? They're just interstitial places and there's 134 of them not counting downtown and maybe Long Beach and you name your community. And I would have said these would be these incredibly, I mean, if the Venice canals are interesting and they're kind of simple and small scale, these would have been absolutely kind of phenomenal environments that would have defined the city. For me, there's just, just incredible kind of possibilities. You get... I, I, I think, yeah. The... Could you imagine this thing actually just, yeah. being, just build it out? It's an amazing kind of thing. I, I I think it's totally unique. I mean, that's that's the thing that's so bizarre about it. I mean, it's I mean, uh, so the 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 big issue is what do you do with the pits? You know, so how do you make them something? And so that uh, I guess the first scheme really dealt dealt with that as a you know they didn't try to fill it up. It, it just this. It doesn't have to be water. It could be landscape. No, it could be landscape. Sure. Right. You know, and the edges are kind of interesting. You know, the building built into the edges make kind of, it makes it interesting. You know, the, the second scheme, um, it, I think it's, it, it, one has to be, be more important than the other, perhaps, you know. Uh, so maybe you create a, a new center in one, and then the others are smaller pieces. Um, hmm. you know the opportunity at Irwindale is 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 the pits <laughs> doesn't Ed Roski have his his offices out that out there and they they wanted uh, to build a football stadium in one of these things I think at one point and so but I mean, you, I, I mean you could really I mean the idea of turning the city around would be kind of really fantastic I mean create a whole new place and um yeah i agree i think they but and i think each of the schemes we could highlight some of the contrasts tom but i you know what i'm hearing in the jury and in the students presentations and what i'm seeing are ways that these that these present um different kinds of synthetic landscapes that are unfamiliar to yeah. the los angeles morpho urban morphology i mean the venice canals have nothing to do with Los Angeles, right. you know, in principle, right? And it, and it has a, hard, a huge component of placemaking, as you're pointing out, Tom, because of the texture, because it's more inwardly focused. Those are very contradictory things that Abbott Kinney did when you're right on the beach, right? Like, why would you turn inward, not out to the coast? And I think similar kinds of counterintuitive you know, artificial landscapes and how you monetize them is some of what I see as the potential here. You know, whether that's, you know, I, I, I was chatting with Wilson saying I would call his project kind of Sonota urbanism, but, yeah. you know, I mean, I think that um, or uh, Lawrence's, you know, uh, wildlife bridges, there's, there's different ways to talk about these presenting very interesting landscapes and I think what's important about that is they're closely reading latent assets on the site that might be barely perceptible to contemporary culture in LA. That is Bill's saying you could kind of flip that, you know, because there's such right. cultural innuendo around the pits, quote unquote, that you know, you you turn those into, I don't know, a waterfall I threw out at one point. You know, could you could you flip that and turn that into a very specific and there are falls, you know, you guys know of the falls in LA more than I do. There's, there's ones that are in the LA river. And so I, I think that idea that you could invert these landscapes and repurpose the existing assets is really important to them. And I find, I find it very, a very compelling part of the studio, Tom, and this yeah. idea that you oh, understand- the cenote is perfect. It, it happened to have, I happen to have a cenote diving family and we we spent we spent time down there, and but it'd be um, 
but it's kind of an interesting unique that, that came out of another condition, which is the mining. Yeah. So we're just transforming something that at yeah. this point is a negative into something that's extremely compelling that does yeah. have other connective tissue to other natural events like a cenote. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah exactly. They're artificial, though. Absolutely. Yeah. I would question the artificiality of it, I suppose. I mean, I, I, I like that, you know, Tom's project began in sort of a dead tech repurposing. That's kind of where it came out of. And so it's here in those mine mining fields, which I think is fantastic, but I do think there's a tendency or an interest to green it over. And that would be where I've kind of continued to suggest that that may not always be the answer, that the answer to Los Angeles uh, and to repurposing and recreating and creating an event space out of this may not always be making it uh, green, um, especially when the ecology of that space isn't necessarily green in itself. It's a much more brownish kind of color. And there's something about that natural landscape, which I think should be embraced and studied and maybe brought to life mm -hmm. in sort of a new, exciting way. That's all I, I find But it in that respect, it can still be used as something that is very much more productive than what it is right now, because right now Absolutely. it is simply a pit for gravel, for concrete and all of that. Yeah, so I think in the very near future, it can be way more. It can be not just, it, it's not about this greening for aesthetics only, but it is about greening as, as a productive landscape for all kinds of um, landscapes, productive agricultures, things like that, that we are studying right now that we know are working and floating farms uh, could be uh, absolutely done here, right? You know, the, uh, uh, Stephen, the, the analogies are kind of interesting, but, but I can't see you, David. You're on my screen. More than Cenote, by coincidence, the exact place I'm in right now, a hotel room on a, a, an edge about 200 feet at the edge of a volcano, which is a little bigger, about three miles across this, this edge condition. And it's this most, one of the most unique environments in the world that everybody knows, right? And, and um, um, we're looking at the same kind of qualities that take place. I'm looking across now at another another hotel on another ridge built on another 200 foot precipice. And it's just, um, it's kind of obvious. <laughs> it's not even a huge invention, right? And in the middle of it happens to be, in this case, happens to be water, but it produces a micro environment that even produces a vineyard. Uh, uh, Fane, you're a wine guy. The, 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 the wine grows on the ground like vines. And it takes its water from um, the air, from moisture, because the there's a micro environment here, which is unique to the island, right? And it goes on and on. And you're looking at these found conditions and just expanding those kind of possibilities is all we're looking at, really. And looking at their implication within the broader metropolitan area of the 17 million blah, 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 the, the thing that we call Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I would think that... Uh... Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things to th think about. It's really the idea of social equity is also a really interesting thing, but it, it probably leads to something that's much lower in scale. And um, uh, on the other I hand, that's unclear. That's unclear. It's uh, it could how, be how, social equity on a much larger scale than we sometimes imagine. But I like the I like the idea of trying to work with the neighborhoods and and. Uh, it's a little more like a Don Turner would do in appropriate technology, you know, and trying to, trying to, if you do one thing here, it's going to create something over here that you have to deal with, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting idea, especially if you, if you, you uh, offer up the land free, <laughs> that would be really interesting. <laughs> and certainly would be a, it certainly would be a motivating factor. So, um, but I, I also like the idea of, of having this uh, having this uh, this piece of, of land that no one thinks they can do anything with, and you right. you end up creating a kind of new new thing, and it, it appeals to a, a a new lifestyle in a way. And you know there are pieces in all of these schemes that kind of have a piece of that, you know. And I uh, seeing all four of them together is very good, Tom. By the way, this is kind of cool. You know, you can. 
Okay. Hey, I want to thank you all for a, um, a really interesting conversation and for the time you spent. Okay. And um, my gang, uh, good job. Really, yeah, really job, compl super complicated oh, yeah. project. And very it's uh, demanding a lot of you guys and under very tough conditions at the same time, obviously, with this whole COVID thing. Hey, hang in there. It was really tough. I know you, we were in. She's all of it with. She's in China, and she all of it was on Zoom, and it was really a, a challenge for you. And I know it was, Faye, and I, I appreciate it. Okay, guys. Thanks a lot. Congratulations, guys. Yeah, hey, I'll be talking to all of you soon. Fun. Okay, we'll, we're going to get together one more time to kind of wrap this up. Okay. Congrats. Bye. And again, Jerry, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. David, I'll talk Thank to you, you soon, all. too, okay? Hey, Thanks, yeah. everyone. David, Eric. <laughs> okay, okay, guys. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, guys.